Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be stand for the playing of the national anthem. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, residents of Watton, Kingsland, and the surrounding areas, welcome to another of the Barbados Labour Party's meetings. This evening, we've got a cadre of speakers who are going to talk to you about what has been done by this administration in a short space of time. They'll speak to you about what they've been doing in their respective ministries, within their own communities and their own constituencies. But most of all, we're going to talk to you about why it's important for all of you to come out in your numbers on the 19th and make a decision, and a very serious decision, a decision as to whom do you want to manage your affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell you what Barbados was like prior to May 25th, 2018. I've lived it. You have lived it. We all know what the problems were. But you also know what has been done in three and a half years to correct most of those pressing issues and to begin the process of putting us on a recovery track. I don't want to get into any semantics, any other of rhetoric, these types of things, but what I do want you to do is to give every single speaker that you, you, you hear and you see tonight, lend them your ears. Listen carefully to the issues. We're not going to be getting into any talk about talking about people and all this, this, this type of things that sometimes people expect on political platforms. This is too serious a time for us to find ourselves in that kind of discussion or, or that kind of behavior. Now is the time for us to seriously think about where we want Barbados to be. What are we as individuals going to do to help that process? Because at the end of the day, we are all Barbadians regardless. And so I want to bring to this meeting this, this evening a sense of patriotism, a sense of optimism. And, you know, every time I, I, I hear the national anthem, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, it, it really drives me. It gives me that energy that sometimes when you feel like you, you know, like giving up, when you're dealing with so many pressing issues, once you hear that national anthem, regardless if you're at home or abroad, uh, it fills you with a certain amount of pride. And I want you to feel that pride this evening. And a lady who knows a lot about being patriotic. This, this young lady has been vocal, has put her point of view 
in the newspapers long before she got into elective politics. Um, and she is now the minister responsible for tourism. And as you know, when we were all growing up, most of us in my age group, one of the slogans that we had at that time was tourism is our business. She has made it her business. And she's here tonight to speak to you, to tell you about the things that they've been able to achieve in a short space of time and where they're going to take tourism. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome to this podium and to the stage, really, uh, a lady full of energy, full of great ideas, a hard worker. Please welcome Miss Lisa Cummings. Don't stand for my play that you best. Get out there and give me get the X. Cause you know me, LP is the best. If you love far better as bad as me. Me and the team BLP. Me and the team BLP. You want the best for this country. BLP. Barbados Labour Party is for me. BLP. Good night, Kingsland, all of the surrounding areas. Maybe if you can hear me as far over as Water Street, good night. I am so happy to see the faces that I can see across from me. And I know I want to also take the opportunity to say good night, Barbados, because I know you are watching us online. You are watching the Barbados Labour Party, and we commit to you that we are the party to keep your eyes on because we have a vision for you, we have a vision for our nation, and we are using our platforms all across this country to talk about you, to talk about what we are doing, what we have done, and what we will continue to do with your support for you. We will not be those people, however, who use our platforms to go down a very different line, and we have seen so much of that regrettably throughout this campaign. And that tonight is where I want to start. Now, my friend and colleague John, when he was introducing me, he had no idea that as I was driving here tonight, I was thinking about myself long before I was in active politics. I remember being a young woman, and I hope that some of the young people listening to my voice tonight understand what I am talking about, because I know you identify with that. I was not always a member in the Barbados Labour Party. I always leaned towards the Barbados Labour Party. I remember in the 2008 election, I was called a closet B, because I was, at the time, not overt in my support for any political party, even though I was very supportive of the Barbados Labour Party's policies. But as I approached 2008, I remember saying at the time, this Democratic Labour Party administration at the time, the manifesto that they were presenting, is strong on emotion, strong on sentiment, high on gimmickry, and very weak on policy. Well, we all know where that led us. We saw 2008 become 2013, and I almost went into depression in 2013. And it was after 2013 when they came back to office. And for a week after the election of 2013, this country had a darkness over it. Because we knew that we had made a mistake on the day we went to the polls. We said, Kadir, give them a chance. They seem bad. They're saying things that we may think we can identify with, but let me try them for another time. And then what became bad went to worse, and then it became a nightmare. We know that, Barbados. What on you know that? I know that. Barbados knows that. And so in 2018, the only people in this country who do not know the reason why the Democratic Labour Party was voted out from office as resoundingly as they did is the Democratic Labour Party leadership today. They would have us to believe now, in 2022, from their rhetoric, from their manifesto, and I'm going to go through their manifesto and compare it in key areas tonight to the Barbados Labour Party manifesto. 
they would have us to believe that a manifesto that was light on policy in 2008 and we saw the results, a Kader vote in 2013 and we saw the results, a rejection that was resounding in 2018 and you have seen a resurge in this country we call Barbados that we love. We have seen the impact of leadership, vision and an investment in policies that benefit people. Now, I am not here tonight to talk about the pandemic because we all live in it. We have gone through it. Everything I can tell you for the most part, you know, because we lived in our households and we experienced it. So you know when this part, when this field here had none of those planes that just before I came to the stage were flying over it. You know what that looks like and you know when they came back. Do you have any confidence? And I want you to answer this question seriously. From all you have seen of the Democratic Labour Party, do you believe that the party that led this country in 2008 and 2013 would be in a position to lead you in 2022 with all that we are dealing with? Have they brought policies that would say that they have a vision for housing? We are here in the middle of this area and I'm seeing houses all around me. What is their policy on vision? They don't know. If you look at tourism, and I'm going to spend a moment on tourism in their manifesto, because anybody listening to Richard Seeley will think that the tourism god died and went to heaven and appointed him to be his successor. But I am not sure where that comes from because it is not reflected in anything in their manifesto. Well, we got community tourism in the Barbados Labour Party manifesto and a comprehensive detail on how we want it to be developed. There's already eco-tourism and heritage tourism in execution in Barbados, including the UNESCO Heritage Project that was started under the Barbados Labour Party administration led at the time by Owen Arthur. Then he talks about things like Airbnb and standards so that there is a standard across the board. He ever heard about the Barbados Tourism Product Quality Unit? It exists, my man. If you would stop going to meetings when you were Minister of Tourism and actually show up to the meetings and not use money to go elsewhere or show up to the meetings and keep your eyes open and awake and pay attention, you might have an idea that there is a tourism product quality unit. But he don't know. He wouldn't know. And so he has brought nothing to the manifesto that says, in a community that is in Christchurch, close to the South Coast, where tourism projects are in abundance and you have seen the investments that are already ongoing, including in Ocean Stew and elsewhere, he can't tell you how he proposed to deal with community tourism in an area in Christchurch, but I can tell you the Barbados Labour Party has every intention of creating community tourism villages, working with an, ent with an entity called Beta, which is the Airbnb Association, and we have done that for the last two and a half years, last three and a half years, I'm sorry, since we were in office. My predecessor did it before me. I am doing it now, and when I mean my predecessor, I mean Kerry Simmons, who is going to speak after me here tonight. But we have done it as a Barbados Labour Party administration, and we have seen more Airbnb entities registered under the same Barbados Tourism Product Authority in the last two years than were there before. Richard City doesn't know, doesn't know anything about that. When we have an opportunity to talk about you having investment opportunities for yourselves and for your families in tourism projects, including in Sam Lawrence Castle that we have spoken about, did the Democratic Labour Party before or in their manifesto ever propose fractional ownership and giving you shares in tourism assets? They have not proposed anything to you. Yet they would have you to believe that Richard Steele is some Dan Gorgon. He is not. He has brought nothing to the table and nothing new is in the manifesto and nothing he says is true. In fact, when I get a chance properly, because tonight I ain't even answering him properly, when I get a chance to answer him properly because the Democratic Labour Party continues to say things which are patently untrue, easily disproven, written in black and white that if the Prime Minister were to pull out her red bag when the time comes, they would cower in shame. 
but they would have you to believe, as was said on one of their platforms, that Blue Horizon Hotel was sold by us or up for sale by the Barbados Labor Party for a meager sum of $6 million. Well, I know that when I came into the ministry, and when Kerry Simmons was the minister before him, neither of us was Minister of Tourism in April 2018 when the purchase sale agreement was signed. I know that it was not Kerry Simmons or Lisa Cummins. So whoever was the minister in April 2018, prior to the election of May 2018, would have to answer that question. Not the Barbados Labour Party. What we can tell you we did when we came to office was to say pause. Pause. Every single contract that they signed was messy. Pause. No termination clauses. No ways out. Pause. We said to pause, including on those contracts to which he refers. Now, they go on to talk about, in the same section of tourism, how they want to be able to connect average Barbadians to the sector. But how? How have you shown you care? They didn't tell us nothing. Have you seen it? I haven't. But what I can tell you is that this Barbados Labour Party, when the pandemic struck, we introduced a program for tourism workers, many of you in this community who work in the airport, in hotels on the South Coast, restaurants all along the coast, you were able to benefit from your companies staying afloat. They were not just hotels, we even had water sports operators, tour operators, restaurants, not just hotels. And the best program that they would have you to believe is the worst thing. What was their alternative? Did they put it in the manifesto? I didn't see it. Did you? We introduced a program that kept companies that employ people, people like me and people like you employed. We introduced a best program that introduced training for workers in the tourism sector. You know how many people how many tourism workers said to me over the last two years, but Lisa, if I wasn't back at work, even if I wasn't working the whole time, at least I had training. They sent me to training. I was keeping myself busy because being in my house, if I had to do nothing but stay in my house for all of this time, I would have lost my mind. But they appreciated the fact that a forward-thinking Barbados Labour Party, led by the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, thought that it was critical not just to protect jobs, but also to ensure that people were kept engaged and busy and that the emotional impact of COVID was blunted because they were kept busy. That is not to say that everyone came back to work because it's not a perfect world and in as much as we would have liked to have everyone back out, not everyone came out. But there was a program in place and the National Transformation Initiative has done a phenomenal job of training thousands of Barbadian workers during this time. The Barbados Labour Party also has produced a manifesto that talks about things like foreign policy and foreign trade. Now, I took a moment to look at the Democratic Labour Party manifesto also in this area. This whole manifesto seems to be related to Winston Hall because you can't find anything in it. Everything is missing, including substance. And so when I looked at foreign policy, how does a community like this, a large, expansive community, benefit from something that seems so high level and abstract as foreign policy? The Democratic Labour Party has no ideas, but the Barbados Labour Party tells you that communities and business people, including small business people who live in communities all across this country like this one, are to be given an opportunity in a dedicated forum where we connect businesses in Barbados to the top businesses 
internationally as part of a global accelerator to help grow Barbadian businesses and to help them to internationalize. Now, the Democratic Labour Party is talking about export-led growth. What does that mean? When you read it, unless you are in their heads, you don't know what it means. And by all indications, they don't know what it means either. Then they went on to talk a little bit in another section that I pay some attention to about the Bridgetown Port and duties and taxes. I happen to have had the privilege to be the chairman of the Bridgetown Port. So I am not speaking from secondhand knowledge. Where did the guns that came into this country over the lifespan of the Democratic Labour Party come from? Oh. Well, I can tell you that when we went to the port, there were no scanners working that would keep communities and homes and people safe from people importing guns illegally. Less than 20% of all containers going out of the Bridgetown port were scanned. But the Democratic Labour Party says nothing about security in the Bridgetown port in their manifesto, yet they presided over the decline of the entire security apparatus at our border for 10 years. But they would wish to stand and talk to you today about people, people. Well, if they were not concerned about keeping the border safe at a minimum to stop guns from coming into the country to shoot people, how they care about people now, Verla? How, ma'am? But how? How did you show you care, ma'am? Huh? They don't know. They didn't have a plan. They did nothing but this Barbados Labour Party administration. What did we do? We spent $27 million to be able to put not just a single scanner, but an entire security apparatus around the Bridgetown port. Now, 100% of all containers leaving the port are scanned. We bought dogs, but, um, sniffing dogs. There are four of them in particular, highly trained and trained their handlers. We did that. We even introduced additional measures to make sure that the perimeter around the port could also be protected because we cared. And then as it relates to clearance of goods, now that is a bugbearer for all of us. I am not the only one. I am sure everybody in this country who went on Amazon or any of the online sites and bought anything, when you ordered it online, it looked good. But when, the, when it hits the port, and the duties get added on, you start to pull out your hair. So people have seen that. But the Democratic Labour Party has filled a manifesto with gimmicks because they would have you to believe that all of a sudden, they're going to reduce excise tax. They are going to reduce fuel. They are also going to remove import duties and hold the cost of freight constant. This must be why they thought that it was okay not to buy no driving, no, um, transport board buses. This must be why they thought it was okay not to make sure your garbage got collected so they didn't buy any sanitation trucks. The Democratic Labour Party does not want to say to people that just like the single families in our communities all across this country, sometimes you have to make choices. Sometimes you have to be able to give something here, give something there. If you know you have a fixed income, what is the amount of money you have available to you? What can you spend and what can you spend it on? And the government of Barbados makes money from taxation in order to do what? In order to provide transportation for you, roads for you, in order to make sure we can look after our communities and look after families. That is where your taxes go. Not some to some of the people up in St. Philip that we all know the stories of where the treasury was parked 
almost to the last five years in the last administration. It wasn't in Bridgetown. It was in other parts of the country being dissected for personal benefit. You can see the benefits of a Barbados Labour Party administration in your sanitation, in plans for housing, in plans for social services being developed. You could see it in new garbage trucks with a man called Adrian Medic Ford, who is also rolling out a recycling program. You can see where your money has gone in taxes, even though we see it coming from one place and it is going somewhere else. So I want to take a moment to say to Barbados tonight, on behalf of the candidate who is running in this constituency, Ryan Strong, I have sat in cabinet with you. You are a good man, a man who has shown his commitment to country and to people above all else. And I ask the good people of this constituency, on January 19th, vote in favor of policies that will benefit your country. Vote in favor of people who have demonstrated that they can lead and they will lead even under difficult circumstances. Vote for people who will say to you, I can't do it here, but I can do it a little later when I get a catch my hand. That is the Barbados Labour Party way. We ain't coming to promise you the sky, the moon, and the stars, and then throw it, take it back in your face the day after. We are not doing that. And Ryan Strong has spent the last three and a half years balancing the books, making sure that our finances are in order so that we can spend on you. A vote for Ryan Strong is to give the vote to Mia Amor Motley and the Mia Amor Motley-led administration. A vote for Ryan Strong is for fiscal prudence and responsibility in Barbados. A vote for Ryan Strong is a vote to ensure that we have a pride in who we are as a people when we see our leadership. That is what we ask you to do with your vote on January 19th. So when you go to the polls, Wharton, Kingsland, all the surrounding areas, I ask you, I beg you, as that young woman who sat on the outside first and was so motivated to see my country in recovery that I am now on the inside, that you use your vote to get the Barbados Labour Party back into the driver's seat where we can continue to be proud, where we can continue to lead you in a way that benefits people without offering gimmicks. That is who we are, and I want to thank you tonight in Watson in advance of January 19th. Go to the polls. We are not voting for an opposition. We are not doing what we did in 2013 in the Kader vote for them. You have seen this party. Give us your support on January 19th. Thank you all, and good night. Don't stand for my play that you best. Get out there and give me get the X. Cause you know me, LP is the best. Wow, 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 wow. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from Lisa Cummings. And the song says, them rest ain't ready yet. Well, you definitely can't be ready if, as she said, you're walking around and telling people that you need to vote for a strong opposition. I want you to think about it. Think about it for a minute. I come and knock on your door and I say to you, sir, ma'am, whoever, I want you to vote for me to be the opposition, to be a strong opposition. What I'm actually telling you is that I have no clue as to what I would do if I became the government. So the next best thing you could do for me is to at least give me some seats. So vote for me as an opposition. Now, Barbarians are smart people. Who in the right mind does ever leave home to vote for opposition? This makes absolutely no sense. But this is the kind of talk 
that people are going across the length and breadth of this country and knocking on people's doors and telling them, vote for a strong opposition. But stop and think for a minute. Who is the strongest opposition that any government could ever face? It is you, the people. You're the ones who use from calling programs to the social media platforms to the unions that you join. You are the greatest. And you proved it in 2018 that when you speak, don't care who it is, they have to listen. And so people, as Lisa said to you, this is about you. This isn't about who you like or who your grandmother vote for, or your grandfather vote for, in the years gone by. This is about leadership, yes, but it's more than just the leadership of the parties. This is about what kind of leadership that you are going to show as persons having families and running homes. The decision that you make is going to have ramifications for all of us going forward. But like I said, We've got a cadre of great speakers here with us this evening at Wharton. Your candidate will be here a little bit later, but I don't want to hold up too much of the time. This next gentleman that is com coming to the podium has been a staple in the political life in Barbados for many years. Uh, you know him as a fantastic speaker. But I know him as a hard-working colleague. I know him as a fantastic minister responsible for small business, commerce, and energy. And as we, we go forward and we begin to look at opportunities for you to make some money, to better yourselves, to be involved in all of the franchisement that has to happen in this country so that lives improve. He is going to be very much a part of that. Ladies and gentlemen, he's been from platform to platform all evening long, so his voice is not as good as mine is at this point in time, so you may have to turn up this microphone a little bit for him. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your hands together and welcome to the podium and welcome to the stage, none other than Comrade Kerry Simmons. We go. Good night, Wharton. Good night to all of you within the earshot of my voice. I really am happy to be here tonight to speak in support of the candidacy and the candidature of my friend, Mr. Ryan Strawn. I want, you, I want to begin by saying to you that it, he matters to us in the Labour Party. I believe that it matters to you, and I want you to go out in your numbers to give Ryan your support. And why? I ain't just come to beg, I've come to give a personal testimony on behalf of Ryan Strong. And this comes from the heart. So in a sense, it is a labor of love, a man that I see as a political brother. Ryan Strong's work in the government is critical. Because he's the Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance. The Minister in the Ministry of Finance at a time when this country was undergoing the ravages of the worst pandemic, quite frankly, the worst state of affairs that Barbados has had to contend with since we were an independent country. And that means that just to pull the immediate health care numbers before you, $300 million had to be mobilized for Barbados to fight COVID. Understand what I'm saying? $300 million. And, 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 and sitting in charge of that, while the Prime Minister has to have a bird's eye view of all the issues impacting the country. Because COVID, as you heard, Lisa, would have impacted tourism. COVID would have obviously impacted the agriculture sector. It would have impacted labor movement. It would have impacted all over. But as we dealt with those things, 
we had Ryan Strawn sitting in the cockpit, making sure that as co-pilot, the aircraft went through the most turbulent of times and went through it successfully. And I can say to you that my personal experience as minister, not only when I was minister of tourism, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the things that happened for you, Watton, the things that happened for you that could not have happened were it not for Ryan Strawn and his willingness to cooperate, his eagerness to be part of new initiatives we found the resources to mobilize 89,000 care packages to distribute into communities such as this all across Barbados. I am 100% sure that the care packages would have had to come out here too. And the reality is that while we had a prime minister who was sitting in charge of a process of bringing relief the people who, by virtue of no fault of their own, all of you here in Waterloo, you wake up one day and you're told the country has to go on pause. It got shut down. They got COVID in almost every workplace. We got community spread. And Verla de Pisa, who did not care enough to raise a hand of bananas, to put a hand of bananas in a truck or a box of eggs, a bottle of milk, a couple of bottles of coconut water. There's nowhere in Barbados that the Democratic Labour Party as a political institution brought relief to the community. No disrespect to young Belgrave, no disrespect, but he part of a party that was missing when this country was going through its darkest hour. And if you are not found present and accounted for in the darkest and hardest of times. It is really a politics of opportunism that you show up in the times when you are now going to be clothed with the power and office of the state. But I go back to Ryan. As minister responsible for small business, I was confronted with a situation where 7,000 businesses in Barbados had to go on pause, shut down. And those are from the most micro, the nail technicians, the barbers, the hairdressers, the cosmetologists, to larger ones like restaurants and so on. And we had to find money to assist these people in some sort of business cessation relief. It is a fancy way of saying that because your business shut down through no fault of yours, then we got to go to the shopkeepers though. And we got to say to them, look, we recognize that you don't have any income coming in, but we got to give you a little assistance to keep you afloat. This country, via Ryan Strong, was able to mobilize, able to mobilize over $12 million of assistance to small businesses in Barbados. And I, I don't say that to you lightly because it is a, a performance that was not equaled in St. Lucia, in Grenada, in Dominica, in Antigua, or anywhere else in the Eastern Caribbean. What we were able to do, what I was able to do for 7,000 small businesses in Barbados, my friends, was unrivaled anywhere in this region outside of Jamaica. And I say, therefore, that in Ryan Strawn, I found a political brother a kindred spirit who understood the need, even in the toughest of times, to be able to make sure that we so managed and structured resources that we could bring relief to people in their darkest hour. But he was not satisfied there. Watton, you're being asked tonight to elect a man who has stood shoulder to shoulder with the ordinary people on issues of greatest importance to them. And I give you an example of what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking, for example, about the wage at which the, the security guard, the wage at which the janitor, the wage at which the cashier is paid in Barbados. Do not tell me that people who do those jobs do not live in Wharton. 
I know better. And therefore, when you come to judge Ryan Strawn and his performance as a minister, you have to be able to recognize that you're judging a man who stood on the side of making sure that government's revenues were so distributed that we could give a minimum wage increase for the first time in nearly 20 odd years to the lowest workers in Barbados, the lowest paid workers in Barbados. And when we were doing that, when Ryan Strawn and his Ministry of Finance were leading that charge, what was the opposition saying? Ain't ready yet. That's exactly what they said. They really pulled this song from thin air. They said that they are not, we as a country are not ready yet for that. They said, like some people in private sector said, that if you give the minimum wage increase, that the country could not afford it. And Mia Motley and her judgment and her wisdom, and I can talk to you a little bit about judgment tonight, decided that on April the 1st last year, we're going to intervene and we're going to grant that minimum wage. We took the position that it is never a bad time to do the right thing for the people. And just as she said three and a half years ago in this constituency, when they told her as leader of the opposition that if she gave non-contributory pension increases to the old people in Barbados who were scrunting to make a, a living, to earn a living to put together, that they had $250 in the hand when the month come. And Mia Motley stood in this constituency, I believe it was in, in, in further road or it was in Kingsland, I can't remember where it was. And said, give her the vote and watch her. And you gave her the vote, you watched her. And the minimum wage was increased so that where it is tonight is somewhere in the vicinity of four, $500 a month when the month come. They said it was impossible, that it would cripple the country, bankrupt the economy, not done. And in the same exact way, against the same opponents to progress for small working class people, we changed the minimum wage in Barbados. So that tonight, those people who are the lowest paid category of workers have not been spurned and refused an extra $10 or extra $12 for a day's work. That is what we are talking about when we talk about intervening in an effort to make sure that we have progress for the people. I say to you, Ryan Strawn is a hard-working minister, but also a hard-working MP. And I can say that because in my ministry, there is a, a government department called the Barbados Trust Loans Incorporated. And that is the place where the small business people the micro business people come when they want to get financial assistance to advance their business interests. Now, my friends, I can stay on my, from my desk and tell you who's serious and who is not quite so serious, who working or who is really not working that hard, because I can stay from my desk and see where the applications for loans are coming from and the kind of business activity that is being stimulated in certain constituencies. And as minister responsible for small business, I take a certain pleasure in standing here to speak in support of Ryan Strong, because Ryan Strong's constituency, my friends, in the last three and a half years, has seen $570,000 in loans for the smallest of businesses in Barbados. I spoke on the platform in St. Philip a couple nights ago, and I talked to a whole parish and told them that they have a right to feel proud because the parish of St. Philip saw $1.2 million in loans. But Ryan Straw constituency by itself has done one half of what the whole parish of St. Philip has done. And that should make you feel good, that you have an MP, a serious trained economist, working obviously 
with young people, young entrepreneurs, making sure that they understand where the window of opportunity exists to improve their business of their business um, interests. We understand where the window of opportunity exists for them to get credit, which is the oxygen on which a business must feed, and ensuring that they are given the assistance, not a handout, but a hand up, that they're in a position to benefit from loans such as those given in the trust loan department. And so tonight, the $575,000 that Ryan Strong has been able to pilot through this constituency to help people who are nail technicians, to help people who are cosmetologists, to help people who are doing barbering, to help people who are doing carpentry and masonry, to help people who are doing mechanic work. That is part of the, the demonstration, and it is unprecedented because it has never happened before. The last administration had no such facility. Ryan is the first MP in this area to be able to, to, to manage such a facility on your behalf. And the access to the facility has been demonstrated as being superb. And I feel that you should feel proud about the representation in real terms from, a, from an MP who has obviously taken this opportunity seriously. And then what of, what of this playing field I stand on? Well, I've, been, I've been sitting in cabinet, as has John. We have heard when the Minister of Sports introduced this paper that he wants now to completely reform the sporting infrastructure in Barbados. And you heard the Prime Minister, it has found its way into our manifesto. We are exceptionally proud of Dwight Sutherland's work. And we, 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 the Prime Minister has put it into the manifesto. We are going to have a number of mini stadiums across Barbados. And one of the first places, first voices, sorry, to be heard in cabinet was Ryan Strawn making the claim so that you should have on this playing field multiple tiers of stands and sitting. So that you can have on this playing field a mini stadium where you are in a position now, not just to have excellent um, football and so on played, but you have it as if you were sitting in a stadium anywhere else in the world. That's the dream, that's the vision that Ryan Strawn is bringing to you. And I, I must confess, I do not know much about his opponent. That is not to say anything ill of his opponent. I believe I have my ear to the ground. I have been a member of parliament now for 18 years, and I, I, I believe that I am familiar with people who are familiar with the current affairs of Barbados and their voices heard. I cannot think of any commentary at, before this election that I have heard from the opponent of Ryan Strong. I cannot think of any public issue that he has associated himself with. I know that he is a practitioner of law, but not well known as a practitioner of the law. And you know, it is not a time now for people who are trying to cut the teeth or develop a reputation. It is a time to stick with tried, tested, and proven people because we are still in a crisis. This is not time to roll a dice. I have said before in this campaign, it is not a lucky dip. And the Democratic Labour Party, let's talk about them for a couple of seconds, is like a lucky dip. You have a woman leading the Democratic Labour Party who is an, a, a, a sad and sorry sight. And she leaves here in the parish of Christchurch, where the people of Christchurch had come to know her because she represented Christchurch West at the level of the Democratic Labour Party. Thank God the people of Christchurch have never been so um, misguided as to elect her. But she ran on two occasions for the Democratic Labour Party down the road. They came to know her. They thought that they were building a relationship with her. What is it about Verla de Pisa that would make her run from Christchurch to the furthest possible point in Barbados to go up in St. Lucie 
in order to start afresh. What is it that Christ Church West discovered about Verla de Pisa that she's hoping St. Lucy will never find out? One of the things that strike me as strange in this is the change of name. I practice law with Verla de Pisa. She sat in an office with me under the name Verla de Pisa. We sat together in the, the chambers of Johnny Cheltenham and Patterson Cheltenham, now Chief Justice of Barbados. And at that time on her door across from my office, there was a sign, Verla de Pisa Attorney at Law. Lo and behold, she had sought refuge in, in, in St. Lucie, and she suddenly, Verla Graves de Pisa, reinventing herself and her, 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 by her name, and apparently by her image, because all of a sudden she is seeking to connect with Philip Graves and the Graves family. Philip Graves, who was a deputy prime minister of Barbados. Uh, and, and, and what is that about, Verla? What is that about? That you don't, at age 50, have enough confidence in your own skin. If you do not know who you are and not comfortable with yourself at 40 and 45 and 50, Verla, how on earth could you be comfortable leading a country like Barbados? You're still on a voyage of personal discovery, Verla. You don't change your name and run as far from the people who you are courting as you could possibly get. Well, the only place left for her to go would have been with, with Pelican Island. And Verla, this is a serious thing. And Verla goes all the way up there, starts afresh, and begins by castigating Mia Motley as being a leader who has no heart for Barbados. Why well, I already tell you, if I could not muster up a, a crater eggs to carry to anybody else to help them in the darkest hour, I would not be condemning a woman who did more than any other prime minister had to do by way of social care because the challenges facing Barbados requiring social care and social intervention assistance, welfare assistance, have been greater for this administration than for any other administration since independence. And I challenge anybody to tell me that that is not the case. But then it, it gets even worse. She goes down the line, as does her newfound friend, Miss Moore, um, talking about this, this dictatorship thing. And I, I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to make a case for anybody who can make a case for themselves better than me. But I will say this to you about Mia Motley's leadership of Barbados. I invite you to name one prime minister. And I have been around for a long time and I have worked with a few. I am inviting, I am inviting you to name one prime minister who has voluntarily reduced the power of the Prime Minister in any area. With Mia Motley, unlike Errol Barr, unlike David Thompson, unlike Owen Arthur, unlike Franda Stewart, unlike Erskine Sandiford, she has determined that judges in Barbados will not be selected by a Prime Minister but that they will, be part, they will be subject to recommendations made from a panel of learned people in the law. So that she is saying, look, though I can, by way of the constitutional power I have, choose the Chief Justice of Barbados, she did not choose Sir Patterson Cheltenham. He had to go through interviews. He had to satisfy his peers and colleagues that he was well and worthily recommendable. And once he was recommended, that is when the Prime Minister says, I accept your recommendation. Then the other Prime Minister in the history of Barbados that has stripped themselves of the power vested in their office. Unilaterally, all of them have chosen the Queen's representative to be head of state. That's a Governor General. Mia Motley is presided over at the creation of a republic, and so we no longer have a governor general, we got a president. And it would have been easy for her to say that the president 
who has the exact same powers the governor general used to have, no different, will be chosen as all the other heads of state were chosen by the prime minister exercising the gift of their office. Not so. The facts are there. You can't reinvent the facts, Verla. I don't care how personally you want to attack. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the facts. And the facts are that unilaterally by herself, Mia Motley has said, I am not going to choose the head of state. The head of state must be, must be elected by those people who have seats in the Parliament of Barbados and in the Senate of Barbados. And that is an exercise that John King, across from here, participated in with me when we had to cast a ballot. Not true? That's a fact. It had to be voted for and will be voted for going forward. I, I, I am led by a prime minister who is the only prime minister to insist that I, as minister responsible for commerce and small business in, 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 in the Barbados, no other minister responsible for commerce and small business has brought to parliament a bill, a legis piece of legislation which we didn't just bring, we passed. It is now the law to stop. And I know there are some police officers out here tonight, so I mean no ill when I say this, gentlemen. But the truth is that this is a working class community talking in, so let me tell, tell you how it is. Want to know that there has been a history of bad treatment of vendors in Barbados for 300 and, 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 and more than 60, 380 long years. This country's record from as far back as slavery, the beginnings of slavery, has been the maltreatment of people who are trying to earn a little living by way of selling that which they grow or what they raise if it is animals. And you, we have seen it in our lifetimes in Bridgetown. A man come with the train and he put it down. And the policeman come without any prior warning, without any prior notice, and tell you can't stop here no more, skipper. You have complaints coming about you are blocking a, a, a shop door or something like that. You're blocking, you're too close to the highway. You, you, there are too many of you collected here now, and we're going to reduce the numbers when I go out this person go elsewhere. All of that has happened. That's a fact. And without any notice, People who take $500 to buy grapes and apples and oranges and banana to sell in, in town, trace skin over, fruit mash up, and nobody in Barbados has ever seen a cent in compensation for those vendors whose, whose property was destroyed. And very often, as has happened with many of them, because there's an altercation between them and the law, they're on the wrong side of the law, and then they are carted off to prison, carted off to cell. For what? For resisting arrest. That has been the life experience of working class people in vending. And we have a prime minister who they say is a dictator, but this so-called dictator has been the leader of the government, which now has made history in the Caribbean by having a vendor's legislation that guarantees in law that no police officer can come and show you a, 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 a certificate or a warrant or anything and tell you, leave, I am moving you elsewhere. Any order to move you elsewhere, you must be consulted and you must be given an opportunity to have an input in where you're relocated to. And if, in fact, there is damage to your produce when it is this, this thing is taking place, then you must be compensated to the value of that which you had. And if there's an agreement that there's going to be a movement, then there must be provision made by the state for your goods, if they are perishable goods, to be properly stored and taken care of. And if they're not properly taken care of, then the law of Barbados now is 
that the vendor must be compensated. This does not happen anywhere else in the Caribbean. In no country in this Caribbean region is that to be found. And the people who look at legislation and assess it in terms of its quality have described it as a model piece of legislation for the Commonwealth. But yet, yet, the Prime Minister, who told you that this must happen, is a dictator. And I don't get it. I don't get it. And I don't get into the personal attacks and the, 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 the foolishness that is coming from the Democratic Labour Party, whether it is their platform or their strategies. I've come to talk to you, real talk, about your life. Qualitatively, this has been an improvement over what the Democratic Labour Party visited on you over the last, over the previous 10 years. I, dis I, I invite anybody to dispute that. You have a leadership that is accountable. You have a leadership that is transparent. You have a leadership that you can hear and see. Sometimes the complaint has been that you hear her and see her too much. But the point is, unlike from the short, you can hear your prime minister and you can see your prime minister. And the fact of the matter is that the interventions made have been interventions to help you, the people. And I want, therefore, I want, therefore, because I've got to leave this place and go to yet another meeting and one after that, and I cannot stay long, I cannot tarry long, but I must leave you with this thought. Do not judge this government by the standards of angels and gods. Judge us by the standards of men. If in Ryan Strong you find a fault, it is because Ryan Strong is an ordinary man and is capable of human failure. But Ryan Strong is a good man, a brilliant young man who has delivered, who has been at the centerpiece of financial policy and financial transformation for a country that was rubbished by the rest of the world. When before three and a half years ago, all of you, every one of you that can hear my voice were worried about the future of the Barbados dollar or whether it was going to be devalued. Not one of you tonight has that as a fear. Well, good God, give Ryan Strong the credit he deserves. He's been at the, at the center of the transformation, man. And I don't have anything personal against young brother Belgrave. I wish him well. When I started out, a young man told me in, in, on Thorpe's Remain Road one day, he said, Kerry, come here, let me talk to you a little bit. I watch you up and down canvassing and so on. And you seem like a good fella. I hear you talk and so on. You, you, you will grow. You will grow. But you see you, for right now, we can put you on side and give you a chance to develop and blossom. You blossom. And if you have the commitment and so on, then a next toss, you might get a chance at the crease. But not right now. That's what they told me. And I had to take my legs like a man. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that is, that, is what you are, that is what you are faced with now. Nothing against the youngster. But there's no time now. There's no time now to roll the dice. You don't left sure for unsure. In the middle of a crisis especially. So, Watton, as I leave you in the hands of your chairman and the next speaker, I want to say to you it has been a pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk to you tonight. I want to ask you to go out and to cast your ballot for Ryan. I want you to go early. I want you to make sure that you carry the whole family with you. You make sure you carry your friends or talk to your friends. Ladies and gentlemen, do not leave anything to chance. Get it done with early because we need to have Ryan back in the Parliament of Barbados. He has a lot of good work to do. Good night and God bless you.
That's right, ladies and gentlemen, this country is rising. You know it, and I know it. Once again, put your hands together for Kerry Simmons, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! This is what politics is about. Being able to put a case to you without going down into the mud and mud slinging and calling people all sorts of strange names and everything. You know, I've said it before and I'll keep saying it until I die. There's no place for that kind of politics in Barbados today at all, at all, at all. Let me remind you of something. Regardless of who you are, regardless of how much money you got, what class people put you in, what political party you belong to, if ever there's a disaster in this country, you're all going to have to depend on each other to get through it. And the time for that kind of nonsense to end should be now. And after the 2018 election, I thought that it would have been over, that some people would have gotten it when you rejected them. But obviously, you're going to have to do it again is a lesson that they have not learned. And you're going to have to do it again. So come the 19th, as Kerry said, and I want to reiterate this, you don't change course in the middle of a journey where you're going to a particular destination. You will be on a ship going from, let's say, from Barbados to Ghana. And you went through some rough waters. And you had a captain and a crew that worked hard with you and get you through it. And then as soon as you get out of the rough water, you decide that you're going to mutiny and get somebody else to try to run the ship. Not knowing what lies ahead in case there's more rough weather to come. Think of it like that. And make the choice that is in your best interest. The one choice that you have that is going to secure your future. That choice is to stay with Ryan Strawn. You have heard of all the things that he's done. And I know that they have people coming and whispering in your ears that you ain't seeing the representatives and this thing and the next and the third and all this kind of thing. Because these are people who would like you to believe that all you could do where politics is concerned is lying and chill and have a ball. But how can you have a ball when the people around you are suffering? You can't feel good inside if you're serious. Which means that if you're called upon to work morning, noon, and night, you've got to get up and go and do it. Because at the end of it all, there will be a time for partying. And there will be a time for liming. But this is not that time. This is the time to be serious. And the next speaker that I'm going to bring to you is a man who is as serious as it comes. He's responsible for what they call the Thorn Commission. Looking to create people's assemblies, which are going to give you more powers in terms of the decision making in this country. And you heard Kerry talk about the things that the Prime Minister has put on the table and that are being done to empower you every inch of the way. Once you got people talking about dictatorship and all this kind of nonsense. Anybody that is a good leader knows that sometimes you have to make hard decisions. But, I, I, but the, those decisions, even in your own household, those decisions have to be made in order to ensure that everybody survives. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want you now, as, as, we, as we move on with these speakers, talk to your friends. Call up your friends across the country. Talk, talk, talk to your people. Discuss this. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just listen to the other people coming with you and in your ears. Look at it for yourselves and make a decision. But the decision that I want you to do or to make is to ensure that you go to the polls and vote on the 19th. Don't stand home and holler, man, them got it, and don't go and vote. Because you may end up with a government that you definitely do not want. So talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Get out there and go and vote. And the man that I'm going to bring to you now, I really want you to put 
make him feel welcome, make him feel warm coming to this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you none other than Ralph Thorne. Who the people want? Thank you, Chairman John, and good night to the people of Wharton. Good night to all the persons of Christ Church East Central. Tonight I'm here not only to lend my voice to the cause of a colleague called Ryan Strawn, but I believe that this platform it's a platform mounted on behalf of all of us who occupy seats or who have occupied seats across the parish of Christ Church. And therefore, my voice is not only raised in support of Ryan Strawn, but I must extend it to my good friend and neighbor and colleague, Adrian Ford. To my colleague, William Dugid, to my colleague, Wilfred Abrams, and one of the ironies of representation is that you hardly get a chance to say anything for yourself. Please forgive me if tonight I do say something for myself as the candidate for the constituency of Christchurch South. I've listened to a lot of my colleagues over the last few weeks, and one of the messages that seem to be emanating from my colleagues, and indeed from all the politicians, is the message of apathy, the fear of apathy, the fear that the people of Barbados may not be as interested in politics and the political institutions as they used to be. I get a sense, Christ Church is central, that there is something of a distance between politicians and the public. I get a sense that there is a distance between the people and our political institutions. And that is a conclusion that is easy to reach based on what I read on social media based on what I hear from young people in this country, based on what I read in the traditional media. But it is my duty tonight, Christchurch is central and Christchurch, to speak in defense of politics, to speak in defense of political institutions. Because if I'm a politician, I must be able to justify the activity in which I'm involved. Tonight I come to you to ask you not to lose faith in politics, not to lose faith in the political institutions. And I know it is often said to you that people have fought hard for the right to vote and that you must therefore defend that right by voting. It is an argument that sounds good on the face of it, but it is an argument that can become weak when the political institutions and politicians fail the people of the country. It is futile to come and tell people that others fought and died for the right to vote and therefore you must do the same thing. If you don't see a reason to vote, I don't blame you. 
But it is my duty to reintroduce you to a cause, to a reason for voting. I therefore must take you down a historical path that speaks to the participation of your parents and your grandparents in political activity and to remind you that 70 years ago your grandparents were more invested in voting than you are and I will tell you why. In 1951, it was a politician, and it was a group of politicians who passed a law giving to the people of this country the right to vote. And they did that in a context in which the people had no power. You often hear that we occupy one of the oldest parliaments in the Commonwealth. That in itself is a meaningless term. When I tell you, that prior to 1951, the parliament of this country did not represent the interests of the majority of people in this country. We must confront certain truths, and we must confront them for the sake of justice. And it was only in 1951 that we were able to change, and when I say we, I mean progressive politicians, were able to change the content of the parliament. The parliament used to comprise planters, people who own plantations. And if people who own plantations comprised the parliament, they were obviously passing laws in their own interests. And therefore, progressive politicians who grew out of the riots in 1937 and who legalized trade unions in 1940, logically gave the majority of people in this country the right to vote. I want you to understand Christchurch that in 1951, you had to own a certain amount of land to have the right to vote. And therefore, the right to vote was reserved for people who had land. And the right to sit in parliament, the political right was obviously reserved for the plantocracy. And therefore, you found that over the years, the parliament comprising politicians passed a lot of what we call social legislation. Legislation designed to embrace the interests of the majority of people in this country because you were coming out of situations of abject poverty. And I will just take you quickly through the legislation that the parliament passed to advance the interests of the people of Christchurch Central of Christchurch to embrace the interests of the majority of people in Barbados. And you would have found that in the 1950s, the government started to build more schools to give children in this country a right to education. And I say to you tonight, without fear of partisanship, that in 1961, it was a revolutionary moment when the government of the day broadened education, liberalized education, so that all little children in Barbados had the right to a formal education. I say to you without the fear of partisanship because I'm more concerned in truth than I am in concealing truth, that in, 19, in the 1960s, the government of the day passed legislation for national insurance because previously when people became sick at work and had to go home, there was no income, there was no national insurance. And therefore, the government of the day passed legislation to embrace the interests of people. The point I make, Christchurch, is that over the years, you found that your politicians, that your political systems were passing laws to embrace the interests of people. And people were therefore invested in the work of politicians. People were therefore invested in the political system and the political system was there to embrace the interests of people. And we came to the 1970s and there was more social legislation. Around 1975, the Succession Act was passed. And let me tell you what that was about. When a man died and left property, and he had six children. And of those six children, 
Five were girls and one was a son. The property used to go to the son. The succession laws in Barbados discriminated terribly against women. And you found that the parliaments of the day passed laws. You call them succession laws to enfranchise women. And I come to 1981. And in 1981, as recently as 1981, the parliament of this country passed a law called the Status of Children's Reform Act. And that act said that all children in this country were equal. And I will demonstrate why that was so important. Because if a married man had children with his wife, and that married man had a, had a child or children with other women, Christchurch, please don't feel squeamish about these things. This is our Barbadian reality. And the law must always seek to confront reality. And the law must always seek to do justice. And there were several situations in Barbados in which 78% of the children in this country were born to single women. They were born to unmarried women. They were born out of wedlock. And the law at the time discriminated against that child so that if that man died and left property, that child of the unmarried woman was not entitled to take that property. The law discriminated against a child, an innocent child, who never did anybody any wrong. And that is why I say the political system, our politicians, were embracing the interests of people. The political system was doing justice to the people of this country. The political system was erasing injustice. And that is why in those days, people were invested. People maintain an interest in political activity and the political systems in politicians. We come to 1982, the Family Law Act. And I've said, I've related the case of men being married to women. And I can say to you that in the majority of unions in this country, the man and the woman were not married. And the day that they broke up, and he asked the woman to leave, and they used to say, leave my house. That woman had no protection. She could not go to any court and claim because she was not a wife. She, would not, she could not go to a court and say, I want my share. I have contributed to the building of this house. I've contributed to the upkeep of this house. She had no such rights. Christchurch is central. She had no such rights. And Christchurch is central. I want to reintroduce you to the importance of politics in your lives, to the importance of parliament in your lives. It is an important institution. Invest in it. Maintain your interest in it. And I say to you that that Family Law Act erase the injustice, the discrimination against women who lived in a house with a man for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And after 20 years, he could ask her to go back to her mother, to her sister, to her father, and not a right saint. And the Family Law Act, I think I hear some laughter. Nothing to laugh at, my friend. That is a fact. That was a fact of our life in this country, where women had no rights. And it was the Family Law Act that said, single women who lived in a house with a man had equal rights to a married woman. Because if a married woman got divorced from her husband and a husband got divorced from a wife, the courts gave them rights to the property, whether it was a house, a car, furniture, whatever it was. Both parties had rights on dissolution, on divorce. But here was the woman, being unmarried, who had no access to the court. Although she lived in that house with that man, although she bore children for that man, although she looked after the upkeep of that house in association with that man, the law in this country, the law in your country, was saying that you had no rights. Was that fair? Was that just? 
The parliament of this country said it was not just. The parliament of this country comprising politicians said it was, no ju was not just. And that is why the people of this country continue to feel invested in their political institutions. That is why the people of this country walk hand in hand with their politicians. Because the work of politics was the work of the people. It was the work in the interest of the people. And it was a work of justice on behalf of the people of this country. Political activity and politicians and political institutions were felt to be important and felt to be important with justification. And we come, we go on into the 1980s, just demonstrating to you what your previous politicians did. The Tenantries Freehold Purchase Act, you'll hear about it from this platform. A lot of people lived on the edge of the plantation. That is our history. I haven't come here tonight to excite anger or rebellion, I have come to present to you facts of the importance of your political institutions. And a lot of us, a lot of our parents and foreparents lived on the edge of plantations for years and years and had no rights to that property. And it's no point having a right when you don't have the capacity. And the parliament of this country passed the law given to those persons the right to purchase the property. And not only did it give to those persons the right to purchase that land, but it gave to them the power to purchase that land at 10 cents a square foot. And if the Constitution had not been amended, that law would have been unconstitutional because you cannot deprive a man the property that he owns. You cannot force a man, you cannot force the planter to sell his land. It is his land. You couldn't force him to do it. And you couldn't force him to sell it at 10 cents a square foot. And therefore, the government of the day said, we are going to amend the Constitution and make this Tenantries Freehold Purchase Act an exception to the Constitution for the benefit of the persons who had lived on the edge of the plantations. And that is the 1980s. And so I've taken you through the stretch of modern history in this country. And so I hope I have demonstrated to you that the work of politicians has been the work conducted in your interest. I hope I've demonstrated to you that people invested in the work of politicians and people invested in the political institutions and people invested in parliament because parliaments pursue their interests. Was political activity then not a good thing? So what is it that happened in the 1980s? We can come up with all kinds of answers. The 1980s saw a technological revolution throughout the world. And that technological revolution visited Barbados. The 1980s saw a shift in cultural values in this country. Because you ask anybody in this crowd, over the age of 50, over the age of 60, over the age of 70, about the values that they had when they were children. Ask them. Young people of Christ Church is central. Young people of Christ Church, talk to your parents. Talk to your parents about the value systems that they had when they were your age, when they were being flogged to going to a church every Sunday, when they were being flogged at school, and I'm not promoting flogging at school, but our cultural values were entirely different. People's character was judged by its content. And in the 1980s, we moved into the age of materialism, materialist values. And I don't criticize a man for wanting to improve his lot in life, because that is what the previous legislation was about. When you educated people in this country, you were educating them of course, to uplift an entire society. But you were also educating them so that their material well-being was improved and enhanced. So I don't criticize a shift to materialist values. But the problem that 
we had, that we saw in the 1980s, was that people began to judge each other not by the content of their character, but by their material possessions. I could say a lot more about that. But all I will say tonight to you is that we started to witness that cultural shift in this country from the 1980s onwards. And it was coincident with that technological advance, the emergence of the computer. And you know today, I say to you, the parents of Christchurch, Central and Christchurch, that there's a selfishness that has engulfed the characters of our children. When a child will sit for an entire day and stare at the screen and make little or no contact with his siblings and make little or no contact with his parents and make little or no contact with his neighbors, something is happening in the life of that child. I don't blame the child. I blame the culture in which he lives, a culture that is encouraging personal selfishness, a culture that places that child into a cocoon in which his existence is the only existence that is important. Children need to come into social contact with others. An example of that is the present crisis, the present pandemic, the present health crisis that is forcing children into their houses to do schooling. I say to you tonight, without criticizing the unions, without criticizing the Ministry of Education, without criticizing the parent teachers associations, I say to you that children having to endure study behind a small screen is hurting their social development. It is hurting their social development. And we must find creative ways to emerge from this crisis for the sake of our children. And it is incumbent upon us as politicians, as parliamentarians, as aspiring parliamentarians, to find creative ways to resolve that crisis, that crisis that is afflicting the lives of our children. This is not a partisan statement. This is a statement intended to save the young children of this country, of this Christ church. And I say to the unions, it matters not to me who are the personalities heading those unions? It matters not to me who will be the Minister of Education after Wednesday. But I want them to get busy. I want them to get busy for the sake of the children of this country. We have immersed the children of this country into a culture of selfishness, into a culture that is hurting their social development. And if in 1950 it was politicians who gave your parents and your grandparents the right to vote, if in the 1950s it was po politicians who gave your parents the right to an education and the right to national insurance and the right to purchase lands on which they have li had lived for years and years, if it were politicians who did that, it is incumbent upon the politicians today to elevate our children out of a perilous state, to elevate this society out of a perilous state. Christchurch is central. Christchurch is central and Christchurch. Where is your investment in the political system? Are you going to remain in abandonment of the system? Do you feel so distant from the political system? Are you so disillusioned by the political system? I don't blame you because we are not perfect. And we as politicians have failed this country more than once. But more than once, we will succeed. We succeeded in 1951. We succeeded in 1961 and in the 1960s. We succeeded with the Status of Children's Act. We succeeded with the Plantation Tenantries Act. We succeeded with the Family Law Act. Give us the chance to succeed again. Invest in the future of this country with your politicians. Invest in the future of this country with your parliamentarians. Invest in the future of this country with people who commit their lives not to celebrity, but to service. And I've noticed a trend among a lot of politicians in which the pursuit of celebrity is more important 
than engagement and service. Politics is about service. I accept that entertainers will pursue celebrity. They have a talent. If a man can sing, if a man can dance, if a man can play a musical, instru a musical instrument, he is entitled to our admiration. And the two greatest admirations I hold are for sportsmen and musicians. That is a God-given talent. And therefore, I don't begrudge them the right to celebrity status. But politics is not about celebrity. It is about service. And let us get back. Let us get back to the days when men and women engaged themselves seriously in service to others, in service to their fellow humans. Let us get back to that. Christchurch is central and Christchurch. Let us renew those bonds of trust and faith in our political system. I know that some of you feel that there's nothing to vote for, but there is something to vote for. I know that some of you believe that education has run its course. Education has not run its course. Because I want you tonight to see education not as maths and English, but I want you to see education in a holistic way. I want you to see education as an institution in which values are taught to our children. I want you to see education as an exercise in social relations, teaching our children how to relate to each other, teaching our children how to love each other, teaching our children how to play with each other, teaching our children that humankind is as important as they are, getting along generosity, love, and selfishness. That is what education is about. And I say to you, Christ Church, that although we made a conquest in the 50s and the 60s, although we taught our populations the importance of education, that is a job not yet finished. The importance of education now is as urgent as it was back in the 50s and 60s. And I say that because too many of our young people have lost their way. When a man pulls the gun out of his pocket and ends the life of another. That is a serious lack of education. Education is holistic. Education is a total experience. And that speaks to a failure in education. It speaks to that. You and I know that when we went to school, the school day started with an experience in religious values. And I've not come here tonight to preach a sermon. I've just come here to reintroduce you to a value system that made the adults here into finished human beings, total human beings, people who could love their neighbor as themselves. That is what we've come to reintroduce Christ Church is central to. That is the duty of our politicians. And it is a serious duty. And we must accept it. Christ Church is central tonight. Can you accept it? Can you accept that you have a responsibility to encourage your politicians to remain invested in your welfare if you are to feel that you are a part of the system? Tonight, Christ Church is central. I come to you to remind you that you are a part of the system. Do not feel alienated from the system. It did well by you before and it will do well by you again. On the 19th, that is to say, this week, I want you to continue that investment in the political system. It comes once every few years, in this case, three and a half. Constitutionally, it can come once every five years. Perhaps you may feel that you don't get enough of an opportunity to influence the system except for one day. But there are many institutions within the course of that five years through which you may influence the political system. They're the trade unions. They're the interest groups. They're the lobby groups. And I say this in all seriousness. This is the era of social media.
And trust me, your politicians read social media. And your politicians are influenced by social media. Let your voices be heard in your own interests. Let your voices be heard in tandem with the voices of politicians. Let politicians not speak louder than you, but if there is a noise in the hall of, of politics, let that be a joyful and joint noise between politicians and you. Get involved again, Christchurch is central. Get involved again, Christchurch. Your children are dependent on it. I say that the most urgent task of this country remains the task of educating our children. That is the most urgent task. It was urgent in 1961, and it is no less urgent in 2022. I see it every day. I see the lapse in values. I see it, I experience it, I witness it, I go to court and I, I feel it. And the things that you hear in these courtrooms would appall you. And the things that you hear in the inner chambers of the courtrooms would appall you. Christ yourself, please get involved again. Please get involved again. I will just leave you with Philippians 2, 3, which is my political injunction, the injunction of Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, put others above yourselves. I think that should be the injunction of every politician. And when that becomes the injunction of every politician, and when you can judge every politician for having met that biblical injunction, you can feel safe, Christchurch, that the system is once more working with you. You can feel safe that the system that has failed you before is now ready to offer social salvation and political salvation in this country. I leave that with you, Christchurch is central. I leave that with you, Christchurch. I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience. And I wish God's greatest blessings upon you. Thank you very much and good night. Who the people want? Tell them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what I've been talking about all evening. The difference in the platforms. You heard Lisa Cummings. You heard Kerry Simmons. You've heard Ralph Thorne. Each of them bringing something completely different to you, but of the equal importance. Each of them pouring out their hearts. It's not a platform for making sport, as the old people would say, and cursing people and carrying on. Those days, we want to put them behind us and have discourse like this, where we can reason, where we can think seriously about what we want for ourselves and for our families, and by extension, the region and the world, as we play our part. This continuous talk about leadership. Who do you want to lead you? Who has been able to manage crisis after crisis after crisis? You've lived it. You've seen it for yourselves. Why would you deny what you have seen? choice is clear. But, as Rav said, you have to be engaged. 
You have to be invested in your own future. And come the 19th, you need to get out. As Rav said, you need to get out early. You need to put all the small talk, like go in this ear and go through the other one. But you need to think seriously about what role are you going to play in ensuring that your future is secure and safe. I say to you that your future is secure and it is safe with Mayor Amor Motley and the Barbados Labour Party. And let's get serious. Because if you're truthful as Barbadians, the Barbados Labour Party has had to come to the rescue of this country time after time after time after time. And you had some people in another party who shall, rename, who shall remain nameless. I refer to it as the demolition party. But you had these people who almost kill you. They almost kill you. In fact, I dare say that the best thing that they did was to prepare us for COVID-19. Because we had a pandemic called the Democratic Labour Party for 10 years. And that is why we've been able to manage it as we have. Because we were prepared. And now these same people are coming out the woodwork like wood ants. And busy busy in people's ears. Oh, when last you see Ryan Strawn? When last you see Kerry Simmons? When last you see Ralph Thorne? When last you see... Th but you should ask them, when last we had a good time in life? Because all they're talking about is partying and liming and chilling. Was the country was burning. In fact, I found it so interesting that somebody had the unmitigated gall to tell you in your face that the 10 years the Democrat Labour Party were glorious. I mean, are you serious? But you can imagine that if the person believed that those 10 years were glorious, <laughs> what would happen if we were gullible enough to listen to their rhetoric and give them the opportunity to finish the job that they started with us. This is not about friendship. This is not about who you like. None of them things. Who you see regular and who can lime and chill. And have. There's a time and a place for everything, ladies and gentlemen. But this time, from 2018, has called... For Ryan Strong, Adrian Ford, Cynthia Ford, Marsha Cattle, I could name all of them, to put their hands to the plow and work. And work not for themselves, but for you, and for your children, and for your future. You can't compare that to other people who took you for granted. Waste money and talk a lot of nonsense. And then when you thought that the nonsense were finished, you find yourself in the election again and more nonsense coming out the motor game. But we will reject that the second time. You have to get out and go and vote. The next speaker I'm going to bring to you, I call him the clean 
and green man. The clean and green man. This gentleman, Christ Church, is responsible for a botanical garden. He's responsible for those persons that you've seen in your areas cleaning up ash, debushing, making the place beautiful again, all across Barbados. We're at one stage. You go down to Waterford, but you only had a day when I, I, I look at Waterford and I said to myself, Lord, have his mercy. I didn't even know that they had buildings down there until Adrian Ford and Trevor Prescott clean up down in there. That I had the opportunity to see that there was some sort of buildings around that place. You thought it was bare bush. The place is clean. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what you have to do. I don't have to tell you. Barbarians are extremely smart people. Don't talk much, but you do what you got to do. But I'm going to encourage you. Get out on the 19th. Get out early. Make your votes. Give Mayor Amor Motley and the Barbarians Labour Party the mandate to continue the work that we have started on your behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, bring into the, now we got the podium. In fact, let me just step aside and you bring the podium so that, so that, so that medic could come to the podium. <laughs> we vote for me, I'm on leave. We vote for the BLP, Barbie and the Slave Party. And let me go along, active. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, make some noise and put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, Adrian Medic Ford. Party can trick me. Let me dance ain't you? The BLP is safe for you. Be a talking that world lovers do. I won't hear nothing from she and our crew. The BLP is important for you. Vote for the future. Vote for the truth. Look, active, active. And give me a good place, active. We voted for me, I'm on leave. We voted the BLP, Barbie and the Slave Party. And let me go along, active, active. The BLP, real active. We voted the Barbie and the Slave Party. Me, I'm on leave, got everything sweet in the country. So no other party can trick me. Let me dance ain't too. The BLP is safe for you. We are talking that world lovers do. I won't hear nothing from she and our crew. The BLP is a party for you. Vote for the future. Vote for the truth. Look, active, active. And give me a good place. Active, activate, activate. The BLP be gonna be safe for here. Look, active, active. And give me a good place. Active, activate, activate. The BLP be gonna be safe. Good night, good night, good night, Watan. Good night, Christ Church. Good night, Barbados. I didn't get hot in here. Good night to every single person in earshot. Good night to those viewers. Good night to all those listeners in the virtual world. I want to say to you tonight, Tonight is a special night, man. Tonight is a night where you'll be told from this platform that your vote, and I want you to listen to me tonight, your vote next week Wednesday will be the most important vote of your life. I want you to understand that your vote for the Barbados Labour Party, your vote for Rain Strawn, your vote for Ralph Thorne, your vote for Wilfred Abrams, and your vote for William Dugaid, your vote for the fantastic Five in Christ Church will determine the future of this country, man. 
I want you to understand that. And it, the sound that you heard, uh, often hear, man, let me get real. Don't stand home and play that your vex, man. Go on that sweet Wednesday and place that S, that S that will determine the future of your children. That S will determine the future of the DNA of this country. And they don't have to ask. And they don't have to recall the dark days prior to 2018. You gave us a mandate in 2018. You asked the Barbados Labour Party and the Mayor Motley Lake government to rescue this country. You asked to restore confidence in Barbados. And you asked to rebuild a country that could run across the global sphere and have recognition. And we responded, man. And who do you have in a leader? I want to take the time today because aye, 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 something is happening and Thursday is going to be exciting, man. It is going to be an exciting period for Barbadians when you left the Barbados Labour Party led by Mia Motley to continue to do the good work. And I ask already, how long is too long when it is good, man? How long is too long when it resonates to your family, when it involves ensuring that your children have the opportunity to go to university, man, when it ensures that the sewage that was all over the South Coast is no more, man, when you had two ministers that you, you, you made disappear with the sewage in 2018, I want you to understand how long is too long when you recognize, of course, that the elderly in this country, the elderly now have an increase in their pensions, my Elaine. I want you to understand how long is too long when all the roads in Barbados are now fixed under the Barbados Labour Party. I want you to understand, man, how Long is too long when for the first time you have garbage trucks that can collect garbage all over Barbados. I want you to understand that they're exposing the platform as I speak. Because when Trevor Presley became the minister, he found six garbage cans, man. And the Democratic Labour Party had the goal, the temerity to tell Barbados that the only I have doesn't, they feel proud. They feel proud of the fact that six is half dozen to them. Their level of delirium, man, is amazing. What I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, how long is too long when you have a prime minister, a prime minister who cares about every single Barbadian and work night and day to ensure that Barbadians have the opportunity to dream the Barbadian dream. I want you to understand what this is all about. A lady who spends morning, who spends evening, who spends nighttime, man, who spends those hours in the morning that you all, you all be doing all crazy, crazy things to ensure that your children can go to university, to ensure that your family, your elderly, can have medication at the polyclinic, polyclinic to ensure that every single Barbadian can go have the opportunity to make a statement on the global stage. This is a prime minister that cares about you. And when she decided to court me for elective politics, she, gone, she got the red flag of an old woman near Jane Ford in St. Andrew. And my mother told her, Prime Minister, if you take him from me, you have to take care of him. She did not only take care of me, but the entire Barbados since 2018. I have no doubt, man, this is the quintessence of selflessness embodied in one woman. It is amazing how she does it. Carrying a whole old country, and yet still is able to do those basic things and to come down at every single level to ensure that she has an ear for every single one. 
That is the prime minister that cares about you. And when you go to the poll, you will vote for a prime minister who has left this country. You will vote for a prime minister who spends every single waking moment of her day to ensure that Barbados is recognized on a global stage. You will vote for a prime minister that recognizes, of course, that we are a small country, but we can punch above our weight. As opposed to vote when Thursday come, touch, repeat, lose a man. That's what's going to happen in St. Lucie. You are going to vote for a lady who will lead 29 others. And I want you, every single constituency, to go out there and recognize the importance of placing that S to the Barbados Labour Party candidate. Put it in the middle, man. Wake up early in the morning and understand that this S will determine your future and the future of this country, man. It is serious business. And I want you to understand, the only way the Prime Minister has been able to do this in short time, albeit and in spite of the fact that we were under the worst stress and idiosyncrasies ever placed on a country ever, we had the volcanic ash man that darkened up this country and the Prime Minister decided to react and ensure that we had workers. And Ryan, I need to talk about this man. I need to tell the Barbadians today that we employed oh, in the worst of times over 1,200 workers to clean up the ash that fell on the streets and seek to destroy the drainage system as we know it. That is what we did in the worst of times. And Ryan, you are the economist, man, because let us understand what we had. Let us understand what we have here. The Prime Minister was able to put Barbados on the global map. And they had plans to tell Joe Biden, leave her alone, man, she belonged to me. Leave her alone, man. Only for a time, we only have a hug up for a time. We want to understand, and we need to understand the importance of the job the Prime Minister did in giving us global recognition. It is not happenstance that we have over three billion dollars in foreign reserves. That is because there is a level of excitement about Barbados. That is because the international community recognized that here is a small country with good leadership, with inspired leadership, can push above its weight. And it has the social economic stability to do so under the leadership of Mayor Motley and the other um, rest, of, rest of the ministers and MPs. I never really think that the, the talent pool is short. You have my good friend, Dr. The Honorable Jerome Walker. The clinical precision of that man, man. I remember you had a paper, hundreds of pages. A department tried to shut down and with his vision and his clinical eyes, he can see one dead bug, by bug that was dead. One dead by bug. That is the surgical precision and the detail and the detail that we have in this, it's, 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 um, government, I am saying to you, you have one choice when you go to the poll, and that choice is the Barbados Labour Party. And I'm saying, what you have in Ryan Strawn is a man that has worked assiduously to bring a sense of economic balance to this country. Ryan Strawn has worked hard to ensure, I want to tell you, man, Sometimes we don't understand what it takes. Sometimes you hear that you say, you don't see us, man. In the harshest of times, when we were faced with the ash fall, man, you had the, the, um, the hurricane else. We also had the freak storm, 45,000 episodes of lightning, and then the global pandemic. Yet still, the Barbados Labour Party was able to implement a series of economic policies that ensure that your basic needs were attended to. Food, shelter, water. And we were able to react to all of those urgent needs in a way that no government has been able to do. And I say so without apology. This is the government that you have. But on the other side, what do you have? And if you've met the mistake 
and do foolishness next week, Wednesday, this is what you will get. You, the, sorry, let me this week, man. I, I tell you, all the time, man, I, I tell you, I don't want to even wait to this week because I believe that you should even be discussing them now. I, I believe that Barbadians shall go out, every single one of you all. Get your friends, man. Get your enemies. Get every single body in your neighborhood. Ask them to go and make the right choice because the only choice is a choice to ensure the existence of Barbados. And if you make that wrong choice, you are going to destroy the basic Barbados as you know it. You are going to destroy the dreams and aspirations of every single little child that I see here. You are going to tell those in the toilet of your ears, Elaine and Gloria that I see sitting down here, you cannot get medication anymore. That is the other side. That is the other side. And that is what your vote is going to guard against. It is going to ensure that Barbados have social and economic stability. And that is what you're fighting for. It is not a manzy pansy issue. I don't want to see red all over the country and recognize and feel happy that the Barbados Labour Party is going to do good. I want to see persons wake up early Wednesday morning, man. Wake up early and recognize that you have a duty to protect this country. You have a duty to ensure that this country does not go back in the hands of people that will destroy it, man. This is a serious thing. And Rashid is my friend. Everybody know that in Watton. He's a good man. I will not deny it. But he's a good man and a bad bunch, man. And that we have to recognize a good man with a bad bunch. Easy and straightforward. It can't get no easier than that. And when you vote for Ray and Strong, you are voting for Ray and Strong in combination with 29 others that will work tirelessly to ensure that your children has, have a space, to ensure that the elderly in the toilet of their years can enjoy it, and to ensure that there is a voice for the disabled community in Edmund Henson. That is what you are voting for. This is serious business now. And I want you to understand that you need not only to come out in your numbers, you need not only to tell your friends that you're watching it on social media, you need to go carry the alcohol, man. Break along every single sanitizer that you know. And if you don't, get, if you don't have any, go by the constituency offices of the Barbies Level Party. Collect what you need to collect early in the morning. Ask every single person for the assistance that you need because your vote on Wednesday is the most important vote of your life, man. You have to understand what you're doing. This is a serious, serious conversation tonight. And I want to see what you have on the other side. My president asked me to repeat it tonight. What you have on the other side, I said last night, Lo and behold, if you are not bitten by a pit bull with or without lashes, somebody starts trying to get Richard, man. That is what you have there. I call them the apocalypse, man, the four horsemen. And if you don't understand what you're doing to this country, you will wake up when Thursday morning and start to tremble, man. You will wake up and recognize, oh Lord, I made the worst mistake in my life. But there will be nothing, nothing that can reverse that. We are working hard after 10 years of despair. We are working to remove Barbados from the bottom of the chasm. We have not had it easy. And Ryan Strong, man, Sometimes they call him 12 o'clock in the morning and say, Ryan, I don't understand these little number of things to look so good, man. Help me here. And Ryan will sit down and make sure that he explains every single thing to his colleagues. Ryan Strong has been given 
the economic burden of this country, and he has done it with a plum. I am happy to be associated with Ryan Strong. What and I know you're happy to be associated with Ryan Strong. Kingsland, I know you're happy to be associated with a man that can ensure that your mortgage don't get away from you. I know you're happy to understand that you have a man that is not interested in putting his hand in a cocky jar. You have an honest man, man. You have a man with integrity. You have a man with intelligence. You have a man with intensity. You have ran strong, and you need to vote for him, man. <laughs> this is serious business here. This is not manzy pansy behavior, and I want you to understand what you're dealing with. This is not the lottery. This is your life, and your life must never be given those chances to spin wrong and spin wrong and spin wrong. Like if you go and play buy a lot of ticket. You must understand that when you make a decision, the decision has consequences. And I'm saying tonight, man, when you make a decision in the South, the decision for Ralph Thorne will ensure that the light that Genesis 1 verses 3 speaks about, man, let there be light and it was good, man. There was light and it was good. The good light that you have experienced under the Barbados Little Party will continue in the South, man. And then you go to Wilfred Abraham. They say, wise men come from the East. Lo and behold, I don't want to tell you about the other side, man. And you can go forward and enter the West. And the good but also to do good. And good will attend you, man. Do good. And God will attend you in the West, man. And none other than my good friend, Ryan Strong. Prior to 2018, man, you had a moody rating agency telling us that our standards are poor. That is what you had, man. What Ryan Strong sought to do is to ensure that right now, as I speak, we have 40 weeks. I want to tell you, man, repeat it. 40 weeks of import coverage, man. 40 weeks. No wonder some people get excited. The city cookie jar full, man. And they're getting excited. They're getting excited because the city cookie jar full. Don't like to put the hands on the cookie jar because the cookie jar belongs to you, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is serious business here. I want you to understand that Ryan Strong is your only choice. Ryan Strong is the Barbadian choice that rescued this economic country. And I want to say it to you that if you make the mistake and choose anybody else different, we are going to suffer. That's what I want you to know. Because the Prime Minister has been able to extend her wings across the globe. The Prime Minister was able to go to Glasgow, speak about the existential threats of climate change, man. Put Barbados on the world map at the United Nations. Every single major event, they are, you're asking, where's the Prime Minister Barbados? Where's the Prime Minister Barbados? We want the Prime Minister Barbados. We need the Prime Minister Barbados. And they said already, she ain't going nowhere. It is here, she ain't chance to stay. I mean, we rise off of me and Mount Ain't going here, living both here at all, at all, at all, man. And when's the, when's there come? You have to ensure that you shackle her, that you have an unbridled association with me and my money and the Barbarians Labour Party because it is good, man. And over the three and a half years, we have shown dedication to work. We have shown selflessness. We have shown an approach that ensures the ex basic existence of Barbados. And I said already, the moral test of any government, the moral test is how you treat to the children. Not what we have done to the children. We have removed that albatross. We have removed from the nets of the parents and the children in this country so that they could get a university education. They could graduate with first class honors, man. 
I said already the only degrees that the Democratic Labour Party was allowing in tw prior to 2018 was the PhD because Barbini became pothole dodgers, man. No road works under the Democratic Labour Party. I am serious tonight, man. This is serious business. Wednesday come, man. Wednesday must be a special day in the lives of every single Barbadian and Earshot. Wednesday must be the day that determines your future. Wednesday when you go to vote, you're not only voting for yourselves and your family, you are voting for the next generation of Barbadians. I kid you not, you are voting for every single person that exists and will exist in future Barbados. I want to say to you today as a close, man, how long is too long if it is good? How long is too long if it is ensuring your livelihood? I want you to go and make sure that the returning officer in the South starts to call out, Ralph, 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 you go to the East. I want to hear Wilfred. Wilfred, Wilfred, Ryan Strong right here in East Central. Ryan, 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 and my good friend, do good, do good, do good, do good. And when you come to West Central, there's only one voice. There's only one sound that the return of the will make. And that is medic, medic, medic. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. I feel good, boy. I feel good. Thanks for with me, medic. Medicine working, it working. Who you voting for? Medic. Who is we mentor? Medic. If them want more, medic is doing more. Who you voting for? Medic. Who is the best for sure? Medic. When them must know, medic is doing more. Who fix the roads in Silver Hill? Service is my medicine. And when you're sick, get you a pill. Service is my medicine. M-E-D-I-C Who you want? M-E-D-I-C Who you want? M-E-D-I-C It's safe for with he M-E-D-I-C Who you want? M-E-D-I-C Who you want? M-E-D-I-C Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Medic one more time. Woo! You've heard it. The candidates so far, all of them bringing to you the facts not mock sport business, but serious business about protecting your interests, your future. The next person I'm going to bring to you is a woman I admire a lot. I remember back in the day when she was a minister. She was responsible for transformations that only now people are beginning to talk about when we talk about the environment, we talk about climate change, we talk about all of these things. She was in the forefront of that in the 90s. Ladies and gentlemen, she joins us this evening as an ambassador. She's represented Barbados at the highest levels of the UN, and she continues to do so in her capacity now. I can say she's a stalwart, but she's also a part of that movement when women were becoming prominent within the political system. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage none other than Ambassador Liz Thompson. Who the people want? Tell them. Who are they going to see? Tell them. Who will work for me? Tell them. Tell them. Who are they going to see? Who the people want? Tell them. Who are they going to see? Tell them. Who will work for me? Yeah. Tell them. Who are they going to see? We're not going back no more. We face all the odds before. We know going back is wasting time. Good evening, Watson. How are you? You don't sound good. Good evening, Watson. How are you? Good to hear you. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. John did when I was running, uh, except for 1991, John did every single one of my 
campaign songs. And then he himself later became a minister and served with distinction. And now we wish him well as he continues his service to the country in a different capacity. I've come to Christ Church tonight to greet the people of Watton and to ask you to vote for Ryan Strong, to ask you to vote for Adrian Medic Ford, to ask you to vote for William Duguid, to ask you to vote for Ralph Thorne. And I think there's one Christchurch candidate whom I have not yet mentioned. Am I right? Wilfred Abrams, of course, in Christchurch East. We are now in the closing days of the campaign. Much has been said. All kinds of things have happened. Manifestos have been released. Candidates have traversed the constituencies. Parties have mounted meetings. People have walked up and down. And we are getting close to the point where you have to make a choice. And I want to say to you tonight, I want to speak from the manifesto because it is very easy to say don't vote for the Democratic Labour Party and to make a case. But tonight I want to ask you to vote for the Barbados Labour Party and I want to make the case for the Barbados Labour Party based on our commitments in the manifesto of 2022 and based on the fact that we, even though COVID came just over a year and a half into our administration, that despite that, the Barbados Labour Party was able to fulfill the majority of its commitments made in its 2018 manifesto. And therefore, having done so in the worst of times, when there was little money when everything was against us, when not only did the Prime Minister have to find $300 million to address the COVID effort, but she had to give support at the national level to vendors, to taxi drivers, to self-employed people, to technicians, nail techs, and hairdressers, to people who ran small shops, to barbers. There had to be support under the Adopt a Families program, and there had to be support under the Household Mitigation program, and there had to be support for children, for the elderly. Government programs had to be kept going. The hospital had to be kept running. So if you went in to have a baby or if you had a sore foot, you could still get care. And in Barbados tonight, everybody has been able to get care. But she had to build the prime minister, a COVID care facility at Harrison Point in St. Lucie, the best in the Caribbean, put up in weeks help to save the lives and well-being of tourists and nationals, more importantly. Other facilities had to be put up. Private sector hotels had to be brought into service. Government schools had to be modified. And it all had to happen quickly as the numbers grew, as the landscape changed, as the monster we know of COVID showed its head and its head grew and grew and its tentacles reached further and further into communities, into families, into workplaces. The response had to be rapid. It had to be effective. It had to be certain and it had to be scientific. And Prime Minister Motley at every turn was able to chart a course for Barbados that kept us ahead of the disease and kept us ahead of the others in the Caribbean and kept us ahead of the others in the developed world because of the nature of the policy making and the programs that she was developing for the people of Barbados. 
So on her, the performance of COVID alone, I think the Prime Minister would deserve, and the Barbados Labour Party would deserve to be re-elected. And um, some of you are saying you haven't seen your MPs. Good Lord. There was COVID. This was not a time to be running out of one person's house and running into another person's house and mixing up and hugging up and kissing up. But you saw the service of your member of parliament in the lights that went on to playing field so you know that they did not forget you. You saw the food hampers when you were in need so you know that they did not forget you. You got the checks from the household mitigation unit, the $600 checks, so you know that you were not forgotten. In every aspect of life, you saw the hand of Medic, of Ryan, of Ralph, of Wilfred. You saw the performance of the government, and you know that the government did not forget you. But here, at Watton, I want to speak to you not about what has happened, not about what we did or accomplished, but about what we are proposing to do. Because the meal that you had last week can't do anything for you next week. And with that understanding, the Barbados Labour Party is saying, yes, we have performed, and we have performed exceptionally, but we have more in store. And you cannot get that more unless you are prepared to vote for the Barbados Labour Party. And I'm saying to you tonight, this is not an election to go home to stay at home and let other people go out and vote and make the decision over who will be the next government, over who will be your next member of parliament. This is not that election. This is not the election in which you can talk about giving the Democratic Labour Party sympathy votes because the Barbados Labour Party has a large majority, and I'm making this point at every meeting. On the morning of the 19th of January, the ballot boxes are all empty. You and you alone determine how those ballot boxes will be filled. And if enough of you feel that you should be sympathetic to the Democratic Labour Party. Well, could dear, give them a vote, no? Could dear, if enough of you get up and say could dear, on the morning of the 20th, the Democratic Labour Party will be the government of Barbados. And that is what they are hoping for. Every time they tell you we need a strong opposition, we don't want a dictatorship. We don't want a despot. That is a way of getting you to say, I am going to vote for the Democratic Labour Party. And if they can persuade enough of you, they will slip past the Barbados Labour Party on the finish line. So I want to share with you tonight some of the policies and programs which the Barbados Labour Party is proposing and which will directly impact that community. I want to start with our women folk. For years, within communities such as this, there have been times that our women have come across great need there are times that our women have challenges with their children. There are times when our women cannot make ends meet. There are times when the pot has to turn down, not because you want to turn it down, but because you don't have what to put in it. And we believe in the Barbados Labour Party that at those times, your government must be there for you that we must be responsive. 
But not only must we be, re must we be responsive, that we must find a way of treating to you with dignity, to handling your matter with respect, to ensuring that your issue is resolved. I'm moving you from a position where you are asking for help to one where you have independence. And so we are establishing what is being called a universal citizen service. So that when you have challenges, all of the agencies of government, you don't have to get sent from the Labor Department to welfare, from welfare to somewhere else, from there to the Ministry of Finance, from there to the Household Mitigation Unit, and you are walking up and down all day, and the cashier tell you, we close off, come back tomorrow. Look how you're on the phone, I, you give me a minute, you, you will come into the front of the line, wait over there, and so on. I went into a place to get a government service the other day, and I came in, and the person did not recognize me. And she did not look up, I said, good morning, and she said, nothing. And um, her first words to me was, don't stand up there, move next to the door. And I was asked to stand between a filing cabinet and a space. <laughs> and I realized that everybody who walked in did not get a greeting, that they were told, wait over there. You deserve, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your circumstances are. I don't care what the level of need is. And I don't care what you have done in the past. And I don't care how you have been treated by anybody else. But when you walk into a government service where the taxpayers are paying the people to serve you, you ought to be served with dignity. You ought to be served with courtesy. You ought to be served with respect. You ought to be served in a timely manner. And you ought to be served as if your issue matters because you are paying them. If you were not in need, they would not have a job. They would not be there if it were not to serve you. And therefore, the Universal Services unit, unit will be there to create new avenues of dignity for people, new service with courtesy for people, new timely responses for our people who need to access government services. And not only will the unit collaborate, it will find out what is the cause of the problem that brings you there. What is the seminal cause? What is the root cause? Because sometimes we give you a hamper when in fact we need to give you a job. Sometimes we give you part-time work where we need to give you training for full-time work. And that is what this unit will do. It will find out what your need is address that need, but it will find out the cause of the need and treat to that cause, a universal services unit, which includes a universal services directorate to oversee and have responsibility and accountability for how you are treated. And it will involve the reform of the welfare department and the welfare services of Barbados. This has been needed for a long time. It is now coming, and this manifesto speaks to it. These are times that are difficult. The Barbados Labour Party has already put in place a minimum wage for everybody, public and private sector, in every sector, all across Barbados. But the Barbados Labour Party believes that measures must be put in place to give you additional support and to make things easier for you. 
And therefore, the Barbados Labor Party will be removing that off of baby diapers, adult pampers, antiperspirant, vitamin tablets, things of that sort that you need. The elderly. I spent some time last week because today's Sunday, it's a new day, a new week. Spent some time last week in my old constituency of Haynesville. And you come across elderly citizens. And they're trying to stretch their pensions. And they need to buy basic supplies like Pampers. Or you come across young girls, some with their first or second or third child, they may not be working. In communities like this, I know that sometimes you may only find one person in the house working. You got to buy pampers. Sometimes you need pampers for the babies. And you need pampers for the grandmother. You still got to buy food. You got to buy essentials. You want vitamin tablets for the little children. You got to smell a certain way. You got to buy deodorant. Time for VAT to come off of these items. VAT is coming off so that they go into a basket and become more affordable for you. So that that dollar now, with your minimum wage, can stretch even further. You can buy something else. You can buy an additional can of milk, couple of loaves of bread. You can buy some more food. Because VAT is 17.5%. So if you are buying enough of these items, the money will add up. Sorry, I'm sniffling. And you know these days when you start to sniffle, you got to tell me, I don't have COVID. I had it one time. Last year, me. I got over, I am fine, I am sniffling because we are out in the open and my allergies are acting up. So, part of what we are attempting to do, if re-elected, is to build a new level of wealth for our people. And we will do so by creating a new structure called a Sovereign Wealth Fund. Our money will go into this wealth fund by the use of government assets, lands, and profits. So for instance, Sam Lord's castle is lying down idle. We are going to give that to the credit unions of Barbados. Many of you are members of a credit union. The credit union, you own the shares in the credit union, and the credit union will own the hotel. And the profit from the hotel then will come back to you. And in the Sovereign Wealth Fund, once you turn 18 years old, you will be entitled to a check from government revenues and government profits off of the use of government assets. So that here is the government going to work to put money in your pocket to ensure new wealth. It is called passive income. It's okay, it's okay, thanks. So let me say no. Why the chairman can offer me a little coke? <laughs> but thank you for the offer of the bottle of water. I appreciate it. <laughs> so the, the notion, and if you look at our manifesto, it is online. It has been passed around by, on WhatsApp. You can open it. You can read it yourself. It's called Owning Our Future. And this notion of using government assets to create wealth for the average Barbadian, for all Barbadians to access. You see, before, men who had named Cow and Busy, they could rent out properties, and the income come to them. 
passive income. They don't have to be working for it every month. You put the asset there and let the asset earn for you. But no, it will be earning for LaShawn the price. I don't know if she's a real person. But the point I'm making is this that government's assets will be working for people in communities such as this. And in addition to this passive income, that you don't have to go anywhere to earn it, but it will be yours as of right as a Barbadian. Government has coming up $1.4 billion in projects. And I am turning, I pulled my manifesto very quickly to try to turn to some of them so that you can, got it, you can find out what some of these projects are. In the public sector, $122.5 million in projects is coming. These include the spikes down on Constitution, river flood mitigation and beautification. National road rehabilitation worth 22 million. A smart energy program, 12 million. Water augmentation, 7 million. An investment spread across all ministries, 42 million. In the private sector, the new projects are worth over 100, I beg your pardon, $1.4 billion. Sajikor, 200 million with 900 construction workers and 200 full-time jobs. Discovery Bay Royalton, 200 million in investment, 500 construction workers, 500 full-time jobs. Apes Hill, 25 million, 75 in construction workers, 20 in staff. Margaritaville Hotel Hastings, 100 million in investment, 350 in construction workers, 200 full time employees. And the manifesto lays out all of the projects for which town planning approval has already been given and which will be starting in a matter of weeks after the election. That means new jobs for all of you. And we recognize that as the construction industry heats up, that there will be a need for training if Barbadians are to get the jobs. And therefore, we are establishing new training programs in constructions. There will be 12 week programs. And we are not leaving out the women. Many of you can be tailors, painters. Some of you may want to work as plumbers or carpenters. You can do finishes. You can do all kinds of things on construction sites and some of you may want to drive bobcats too. So we are going to train both men and women. And you will be attached to master artisans and master craftsmen after your period of training to help you refine your skills, to equip you for the job market to ensure that when these places advertise for the construction workers, that they don't come from Georgetown, although everybody from Guyana gone back cause real money flowing through Guyana with the oil, no. But we have to ensure that our people are skilled and equipped to take the jobs and to make the most of these opportunities. And therefore that is the method by which we are going to ensure that these jobs come to you. And this aligns with what the Barbados Labour Party will be doing in housing. For young people, 35 years and under, we are giving you a first time 
Home Owners Grant of $3,000. That means you are going to get $3,000 cash in your hand. If you want to buy a piece of land, you can use the $3,000 as a deposit. If you have already paid, but you have to do legal fees, you can use the $3,000 for legal fees. If you bought a property as opposed to land, that is house and land together, you may have gotten a mortgage, but you need a, to pay your bridging loan, you can use the $3,000 for or toward your bridging loan. You may want to use it for your first mortgage payment. Or, as happens in Barbados, your great aunt or your grandmother left you a piece of land. And you and the family and friends get together and y'all built the house piece piece as you catch your hand. You cover it down. You may want to finish it, put in the windows, do the tiles. You may want to buy Consumer durables, you might want to put in your fridge and your stove, and so on. This $3,000 is to give you a hand up with your first home at 35 and under. Do you understand what that means? That Barbados is already the largest property owning democracy in the Caribbean. And now we will have the youngest level of land ownership in our region. The youngest level of land ownership. That a young boy, 25 years old, who determines that he wants to leave his mother's house and own property. And all of us come up. We want two things to get through in life. Sometimes via university education. And two, to own your own place. Turn your own key. Be your own man or woman. Own a piece of the rock. And the Barbados Labour Party will deliver that dream of home ownership to you at 35 and under. Our grandparents did not know what that meant. Our parents didn't know what it meant. They had to struggle, fight to build a house. Some of us, some families never achieved it only know what it is like to rent, never lived in a place that they had the title deeds for in their hand. But we will be delivering title deeds to those of you in the housing areas who have lived the 20 years to qualify for your properties. We will be ensuring that our young people have title deeds in their hand and as young people know what it is to get a start in life so that our parents and people of our age group, and I forget that I'm now an old woman because I don't feel so old, People of our generation who know only what it is to fight on own one property. You can have one by 30 and another when you are 40 or 50. You will know what it is like as young people to own a property or rent it out and go on and build a second and a third. You will know what it is like to build apartments because the Barbados Slave Party gave you a hand up. But that is not all. Here in this constituency, I am standing on a plain field. And it would be remiss of me if I did not again turn to the manifesto to indicate to you what the government is planning in the area of sports. Now I should know this manifesto well. Somebody's meeting I went to in the last couple of days. I cannot remember who. This is a complaint. They had a lovely little light on the platform that I could see. Oh. <laughs> so let me um, make the point. Corks and lights. Corks and lights. Uh, I'm trying to find, sorry, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being mischievous with the fellas. And I'm being mischievous to crack a joke because I know that this has been a serious speech. And in fact, 
Sorry, the lighting really is bad, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch piece here. I, I want to turn because I actually want to read uh, for you from the pages, oh, found it, at page 29 of the manifesto. And it is important. It is important because as the Barbados Labour Party is looking to ensure that you own your future. We have to re-engineer aspects of the economy. There must be new opportunities for you. And the government has determined that one of those opportunities lies in the area of sports. We are therefore proposing to complete the work started on the National Sports Policy and the Sports Development Act, to complete the National Stadium, to develop 15 new small stadiums, and the manifesto the same mini stadium, don't mind that, 15 new small stadiums all across the island with lighting, bleachers, and maintaining the community grounds. We're overhauling the National Sports Council and establishing a secondary school for excellence in sports careers. We will be starting what we are called a sports economy so that we are going to use sports not just to allow young people to lift themselves up out of poverty, not just to find activity and recreation that is useful, healthy, and brings the community together, but creates for them opportunities to live and earn by playing sports. We have never had the number of sports persons excelling at the international level even though we have the raw talent. It is now the intention of the Barbados Labour Party to ensure that happens. Equally, we are going to establish a horse racing academy. And don't laugh at that. About a month ago, I heard a new story on the radio that Safi Joseph had won, I think, 15 races for the whole of last year and earned something like $57 million, Bajan, from St. James South. We know of the excellence of our jockeys in the international arena and performing in Canada. We know that there are jobs for grooms, for stable hands, for those who care for horses, for veterinarians. And therefore, the notion of the development of a regional horse racing academy provides opportunities for those of you who like animals, are not interested in academics, but have a skill that you want to use and develop in this way. We are going to press for the establishment of the World Road Tennis Federation. Well, road tennis belongs to me, so I don't need to say anything more about that. So we are taking it now from a community activity to an international sport, from a national activity to a global activity. That is what the Barbados Labour Party is proposing. And finally, in the area of sports, we are establishing and funding a sports development fund and a cricket, specialist cricket um, facility, again for training and so on, to create more uh, cricketers in the international arena. And I move to my final point. And all of these, really, have been going in one direction. And it isn't just to say, 
don't vote for an opposition, vote for government. It isn't just to say don't vote Democratic Labour Party, vote B. It isn't just to say don't mind Verla, give Auntie Mia, Mia your ex. Because if you like Auntie Mia, and you think that she has done a good job, and you think she is capable of continuing to do a good job, and keep Barbados safe, and push our communities further, then you got to vote for all her candidates in every constituency across the island. That's how it works. The final thing that I want to point out, which I know is of relevance, to this community and surrounding communities of Gall Hill and Kingsland and those areas where there are large housing areas. When I was a parliamentary representative, I would come across people in my constituency who would ask me for help getting a job. And sometimes I would send them to places and there was one guy, I would never forget him, I lost his support. And I lost his support because I sent him for a job with, I think it was Caribbean air cargo handlers or whatever they call themselves. He was doing exceptionally well. He was so excited every morning to put on his uniform and go to the airport and be working in a high security area, to be working in a position of trust to be well liked and respected in his job, to bring what he felt was honor to his family and his community, that a man like him had a job, a responsible job in the airport. And they were doing checks in the human resources department. And they said to him, well, when we took you all, we had the letter of recommendation from your MP but we did not have a police certificate of character. You must go now and get one for us to put it on your personnel file. And that was when the trouble started. My man had a conviction for a spliff. It showed up on his police certificate of character. He couldn't get a police certificate of character. So he dodged the HR department for a couple of weeks, but then crunch time came, John. Produced the certificate without a stain on your character because our employment rules say to work in the airport in a security area, you cannot have any convictions. And a spliff separated him from his job, from his income from his status in the community. You know, one of these days I'm gonna tell some stories, what it was like as a parliamentarian. Came to me, said Ms. Thompson, you sent me for the job and I went and they employed me and I was working for X amount of time and I was doing real well. You know, you see me going to work, sometimes you would give me a lift and by God problem. And I said, well, what is the problem? I thought you said everything was going well. The people like you, what happened? And he explained the situation to me. He said to me, help me. And I couldn't. The rules did not allow it. He had a conviction for a spliff. He was not a criminal. He was not a drug dealer. He was no big man. He was smoking a spliff when the police picked him up and they took him to court and he was stigmatized. And when I said to him, there was nothing I could do to help because I could not change the rules. He stopped supporting me because he felt I didn't want to help him. But God knows that I would have helped him if I could have. And now it gladdens my heart that that will never happen to another young man in a community like this. And it will never happen 
to another young man from Haynesville because the Barbados Labor Party has now removed convictions for possession of a spliff and your records are being wiped clean. You can get a job. Nobody is going to hold a spliff against you. How can it be that marijuana is being legalized all over the world? That people are making money out of a cannabis industry and you are staying forever because you had a spliff well no more and I want to say to the young men of this community that simple as it is a clean record is the beginning of a good life and that is creating an opportunity for you that you did not have before and more than that I spoke earlier about how government will be using wealth I wanted to get to homes, but I'm, I don't think I'm going to get to homes in its entirety tonight. I did speak about the benefit for young people. But the medical marijuana industry is now about to take off in Barbados. And as I indicated earlier, that government will be uh, using revenues, profits, incomes to pass on to our citizens under the Sovereign Wealth Fund. And that is exactly what is going to happen with marijuana. Those of you who want to invest, who want to buy in, you will be entitled to benefit from this new national industry. Because this can't go like the sugar industry, where one set of people make all the money and they don't look like us, and the people who look like us do all the labor, but we can't get the sweets. That is to be changed with the marijuana industry. These are solid reasons why I am asking you up here in Christ Church, all five constituencies of Christ Church, up here in this Watton, to go out Wednesday morning and give the Labour Party your vote. Give us on the basis of what we have accomplished, but give us on the basis of what we are about to do to ensure that you own your future as Barbadians, as working class Barbadians, and as black Barbadians. This is the kind of transformation for which our grandmothers and grandfathers yearned the kind of opportunities for which they labored. These are the moments that they lived but could not see when a government is prepared to say to you, I want to work with you to transform your life. I want to work with you to turn you from a tenant into a property owner. I want to turn you from an owner, a worker into a business person, an entrepreneur. I want to leverage the technology so that that you can access the world and carry Barbadian talent to the world with the 52 week. John, you should be talking about that. The 52 week entertainment program that is going to be open up every week in the year, a festival and a cultural heritage activity. On the 19th of January, there should be no sympathy votes for the Democratic Labour Party. Go out in your numbers. Give Auntie Mia and her candidates your vote so that every time we hear the counts coming from the boxes, it is labor, labor, labor. And get up on the morning of the 20th, understanding and knowing that Barbados remains safe and your lives and your futures are safe in the hands of the Barbados Labour Party. Good night and Happy New Year. Who the people want? Tell them. Who Barbados need? Tell them. Who will work for me? Tell them. Tell them. Who the people want? Tell them. Who Barbados need? Tell them. Who will work for me? Here. Tell them. Barbados Labour Party. We not going back no more. We face all the odds before. We know going back is wasting time.
Thank you, Liz. Uh, she has to run off to another, another meeting, but powerful as, 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 as usual. Give her another round of applause, people. Yeah. You notice that on this platform, we have been able to stick to the facts, lay a case without trying to tarnish anybody's reputation or getting into any, as my good friends would say, low talk. Oh, yeah, or even cursing and carrying on. This is not the Barbarian's level party way. But the way that we do things is always in your best interest. The gentleman that I am going to bring to this podium now, everyone has told you how hard he has worked. You yourselves know what he has done for you at the constituency level, but more importantly, what he's done for you on the national level to ensure that your quality of life improves. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you your representative seeking your support for another term. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, make noise, put your hands together, and welcome your MP, Ryan Strong. Don't stand for my play that you vex. Get out there and give me get the X. Cause you know me, LP is the best. If you love far better, as bad as me. BLP. Me and the team, BLP. BLP. You want the best for this country. BLP. Good night, Wharton. Good night, Christchurch, East Central. Good night, Barbados. I am happy to be here again in Wharton to say thank you to the people of Christchurch, East Central, for placing your confidence in me to be your member of parliament for the last three and a half years. And I stand here tonight absolutely clear and absolutely focused on what we have to do in three days' time. Because, Wharton, you and I both know what it is like to live through a period where not just right here in Wharton, but the whole of Barbados was neglected, insulted by a government that cared less about you and more about themselves. And you have heard from this platform tonight, Wharton, a cadre of speakers that have come to you to give you absolute clear facts, but to paint a vision for what we want Barbados to be and how your lives can be improved as part of the transformation. So I say it to you, Wharton, and I say it to the rest of Christchurch, a central. It is time to get serious because we have in this country a set of people masquerading, pretending to be in opposition who would have you believe, who would have you believe that the state of this housing area where we are tonight, 
were glorious when they were in administration just three and a half years ago. They would have you believe that all that they did to this country was glorious. But you and I both know, Wharton, the neglect that you experience under the Democratic Labour Party. And so I say again, it is time to get serious. Because there was to be a meeting here tonight. I believe it was postponed. But I'm going to ask you, Wharton, whenever to come back down in here, for you to ask them if they are really serious. Because the cast of characters that I saw advertised to come here and represent the Democratic Labour Party in support of their candidate to you made me laugh. Because there's absolutely nothing that the Democratic Labour Party could come into Warden and advance that they have done anything to improve the lives of the residents of this community. And in three and a half years, not just here in Wharton, but all across this country, the Barbados Labour Party, of which I am a part, Wharton, of which this country voted overwhelmingly in 2018 to administer the affairs of this country. We have demonstrated to you, to Barbados, to the world, what it means to have a country that is well governed. But not just a country that is well governed, but your government can respond to the needs of the residents in the communities all across Barbados, including right here in Wharton. And therefore, when they come to Wharton with their meeting, I want you to listen to them very carefully. And I want you to reflect on whatever it is that they say and then ask yourselves, what did you live through under the last administration and what you have experienced under the Barbados Labour Party? Now, let me be clear. I know, we all know, that COVID-19 has impacted all of us. It has impacted the entire world. But I know that deep in your hearts, Wharton, you know, because as I canvass, all of you have said to me that if the Democratic Labour Party was in power during COVID, you have said to me that half of us would be dead. And we know it. So when they come and bring the meeting to Wharton, I want you to reflect and ask yourselves, are these people serious? I know what the answer is. I know what the answer is. But I want you to reflect very carefully. Very carefully. Because in three days time, Wharton, you will go to the polls and you must make a decision. And that decision has to be that you will vote for Ryan Strong to be your next parliamentary representative on January 19th. And that you will tell your friends and your family all across this land to vote for the Barbados Labour Party candidate, not just in Christchurch, but all across this country. Because, Wharton, I told you on Monday night, and I swear I didn't know. I told you on Monday night that I long to see the day when people will not bring the garbage into Wharton because the Barbados Labour Party was intended to clean up this place. And the next morning, many of you sent me photographs of the Sanitation Service Authority delivering those garbage bins to each of you. And I know that as the weeks unfold and the months unfold, you've already started to see the skit that was at the top where the player part has been cleared. And I say again to you, Wharton, that if anybody come in and dump the garbage, I want you to send the video to me. Because we're going to lock them up. 
because it is wrong to bring your garbage from wherever you live and dump it at other people. And the Barbados Labour Party intends, under my representation, to make sure that your children don't get accustomed to seeing garbage thrown all across the streets of Wharton. That is my commitment to you. And the garbage truck will now come and collect your garbage individually, just like every other constituent in Christchurch East Central. Wharton Housing Area was the only place in Christchurch East Central that you had communal garbage. And you know the rats, bigger than the cats, here in Wharton. And this is not a small thing, because when you get accustomed to seeing something, it becomes normal. It becomes normal. And so I say, when the Democratic Labour Party comes in to Wharton, listen, listen carefully, but remember, remember, remember the weeks on end. When you were waiting to get your garbage collected, but no representation was brought to you. People were bringing the garbage from all over Barbados into water, adding to the misery. But that is no longer the case, Wharton. And whilst much has been said about what I have done in the country, and all of it is true, because since May 25th, 25th specifically, I have been working hard every day, not just to find money, but to make sure that this country of which you are part, Wharton and Christchurch is central, that this country can regain a measure of respectability, that we can have a measure of pride in our communities. And I'm very sorry that COVID has come along and curtailed a lot of the things that we needed to do. But in spite of COVID, Wharton, in spite of it, we continued and we persevered. Many of you have complained for years about the, electric, the electrical wiring in your units. And I'm sorry that the summer surge last year with Delta paused the program. But many of you know tonight, and you can see and feel the difference that the Barbados Labour Party has made with respect to the retrofitting of the electrical wiring in Wharton. So when the Democratic Labour Party comes in here, I want you to ask them a simple question. Why you didn't do it before? Because there's nothing that they can come and represent to you in Wharton that could ever make sense. For years, the persons in the terrace Everything in rainfall, water in people's homes. We went out in the back behind Milton Lynch. And what was masquerading as well, I cannot describe. Because I cannot imagine that you will see something out there. People's homes being flooded year after year after year after year and no attention. The Barbados Labour Party fixed that, fixed it. That is our record in this constituency. And so I say to you, Wharton, my mind is clear. I am absolutely focused because your government, your government, the government that you voted for, has performed to the highest standard. And even though we have met those standards, I know that you expect more. And we shall aim to deliver more. And I know that 2021 was the worst year in all of our lives. It was the worst year. And I hope that this year certainly will be a better year, but I can tell you, I can tell you, if you don't want that sinking, nasty feeling that we all had on February 22nd of 2013, you heard this earlier, you cannot have any sympathy at all. No 
sympathy at all for the Democrat Labour Party. No sympathy at all. Because they, what, they, what they did to you here in Wharton, what they did to this country, there can be no sympathy for the Democrat Labour Party. And Wharton, I know that my opponent knows you well. And you know him well. I called him and I wished him luck. But this is not the time for luck, Wharton. This is time for you to be assured of your future. And you ask yourselves deep down, as I said, you've said to me, if the Democrat Labour Party was in power, half of we would be dead. And I repeat it, because it has been said to me, not just here in Wharton, Edie Village, St. Davis, Regency Park, Vauxhall, Kingsland, Lodge Road, you name it, it has been said to me. It has been said all across this country. And therefore, Wharton, I know that you know what you have to do when you get up on January 19th. Because this is not the time to make sport. This is not the time to make sport. I have been your parliamentary representative for three and a half years, and it has been the most intense period in my life. In my life. Because the scale of the work that was required to address issues, not just here in Wharton, but across this country, the scale was quite large. It was heavy, burden. Because whilst we were trying to do our work, we had to turn around and do theirs. And I know that when you go to work and you see somebody slacking off, you tell them, listen, man, you have to pull your weight. But the Democrat Labour Party left undone in this country a mountain of work that we steadily chip through. We chip through, we take off. And we made it look too easy. We made it look too easy. Because now all of a sudden, people are surfacing. Surfacing. To come to tell you all of the things that they will have you believe as if no fake news is to become fact. But I know that you know better, Warden. I know that Barbados knows better. And therefore, when the Barbados Labour Party comes to you, certainly on these platforms, night after night after night, you know the record of the Barbados Labour Party in the last three and a half years. We have been able to regain the trust of the people of this country to repair the reputation of Barbados. Because like it or not, our reputation as a country determines what happens in communities like Wharton. Because when we go and make representation to access funding, to deal with flood mitigation issues, to deal with water issues, we are given the benefit of the doubt because we are Barbados. And therefore, when the Prime Minister says to you that leaders of international institutions are asking her when we came to office whether the sewage still flowing in the streets. I want you to understand, as a Bajan, that the Democrat Labour Party allowed this thing to happen for three years. And I know tonight the F in toilet bowl in any of these units in here crack tonight. You are not going to allow it to keep running for three years. You can call the plumber. You can get it fixed. I'm saying to you, Wharton, it's time to remain focused. Time to get serious. Because the transformation of this country depends on you. It depends on what you want. And the Barbados Labour Party has crafted a vision that would allow for ordinary Barbados to truly participate in this democracy. To create wealth for you and your children. And I know that COVID-19 
has dealt a serious, serious blow to all of us. And I know that some of you have had a very hard time. But your government, given the circumstances, we have responded as best we can because just remember, Wharton, just remember that we are still paying old bills left by the Democratic Labour Party. And therefore, you can't spend money twice. I, I, I ain't figured it out yet. You cannot spend the same money twice. And the last government did things in this country that they should all be ashamed. So let us not seek to redefine definitions. Because I cannot imagine a more grave insult to the memory of El Bar for anybody to suggest that the 10 years under the de last Democratic Labour Party administration was glorious. I am certain that Mr. Barrow must be rolling in his grave. Must be. Must be. But this is what they would have you believe. This is what they would have you believe. So Wharton, Christchurch is central. You know what you have to do. You know what you have to do. Bright and early Wednesday morning. I want you to get up even before the fowls get up. Get your cup of tea. Break the air on your stomach. Get your bath, get your mask, get your sanitizer, and make your way over to Milton Lynch early. 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 And wherever you are in this constituency, find your polling station early. The lines can be a little longer because you gotta space out a little more. So don't be daunted when you see the lines long. You remember the VAT day? The VAT free day that we have for Christmas? You, everybody saw the video of the people down by popular lineup at five o'clock. That is what I want to see the lines to the polling station on election day. So that we get up and we know what we are going to do. Because we will be voting for a government, a government that is capable of turning, of moving this country forward. We are not going back, Wharton. We are going forward. And so I say to the whole of Barbados, listen carefully, reflect carefully, and let your actions on January 19th say to the Democratic Labour Party that you are not fit for office in this country. You've got to wheel and come again because this country deserves immaculate leadership. And I know that our Prime Minister, Mayor Amor Motley, is going to help transform this country for you and your children. And therefore, Wharton, I want you, as I said, to tell your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, there's one mission on January 19th. And that mission is to vote for the government that you want, the government that you know will be able to move this country forward. Let it not, let there be no doubt. Let there be no doubt. Because when we wake up on January 20th, we must wake up with confidence. Because as I have said over and over and over, when we wake up on January 20th, Wharton, it is time to press gas. Because we have to make some decisions in this country about how we're going to live with each other, how we can get the children back to school, how we're going to transform healthcare, how we are going to create opportunities for you and your children, how we are going to ensure that these housing areas, that we can get them fixed properly. And therefore, when I tell you that I can find the money, I can find it. And when we find it, we can deploy it, and we can put the people to work, and we're going to repair and rebuild this country. Let there be no doubt, Wharton. No doubt. No doubt. When, when the Barbados Labour Party says it's going to do something, we do it. 
As part of doing that, my job is to find the money to make it happen. You have seen throughout this pandemic that even though the government of Barbados lost $600 million, $50 million a month, we still paying the old bills for the Democratic Labour Party. You're still going to the hospital, even though you had to make some adjustments. The services are still being delivered. We had to find new money to spend to finance the public health response. And I know, like every community across Barbados, some of you have contracted COVID. You've experienced Harrison Point and the other facilities. And I want to make this clear, Watton, because in this last 21 months, the government and the Ministry of Finance, we've had to make some decisions. And it's a very simple decision, really, but it has consequences. Because I want you to appreciate that right now, as you're listening to me speak with you, we are all breathing. And we're not even thinking about the fact that we are breathing. But COVID-19 is so brutal and deadly. It forces you to think about where your next breath is going to come from. And your government, of which I am a part, we have spent a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money, because we insisted that no Barbadian or anybody who chooses to live in Barbados would die in a hospital car park waiting for oxygen. I want you to understand something very carefully. We have had to spend a lot of money simply producing oxygen for people to breathe. We cannot take that for granted. And therefore, what that has meant is that every time the Ministry of Health says we need, every, sorry, not the Ministry of Health, every time there's a surge in cases and the number of persons who require that medical assistance goes up, we have to produce more. More oxygen. And there is no cost that you can put on a human being's life. And therefore, we made decisions to make sure that we can save the lives of as many Barbadians as possible. And we are not going to apologize to anybody for that. Because when you or any of your friends, families, or neighbors, or anybody contracts COVID-19, I know that you will receive the best possible health care in this region. Because we took decisions to make sure that we can provide that care without compromising the QEH. But what has also meant is that some of the things that we would, have, we would have loved to do had to be delayed slightly because it is important for as many of us to be on this journey of transformation as possible. And we made those decisions in the interest of all Barbadians. All Barbadians. I regret, I regret that too many Barbadians have lost their lives to COVID-19. I regret it. I regret it. But I say to you, Wharton, and I say to the rest of Barbados, that we, the government of Barbados, as long as you allow the Barbados Labour Party to form the government in this country, we shall not allow COVID-19 to define the future of Barbados. We are going to work hard every day to make sure that you and your family and your lives can be improved in this country. You have already experienced three and a half years of what a Barbados Labour Party government can do. And therefore, when we free ourselves of this pandemic and we forge ahead with a singular mission, a singular mission, which is to ensure that all of you can have a bright future. And part of that transformation 
means that we have to look at how we relate to each other across communities, within families. And I say to all of you, join the mission. Join the mission. Get involved. Show up and take very seriously your civic responsibility. Because if you choose to absent yourself from your civic responsibility on Wednesday morning, then you are allowing cynicism and so-called apathy to cloud your judgment. And as a matter of fact, I am absolutely certain that the Democratic Labour Party is trying to make sure that as many as you, of you sorry, are as cynical as possible because they want you to forget and pretend as if somehow or the other the Democratic Labour Party was only formed three weeks ago and that they have no track record. And you know, and I know, what that record has meant for all Barbadians. We cannot allow ourselves, Wharton, we cannot allow ourselves to be fooled. They ain't ready yet. As a matter of fact, they just ain't ready. They ain't ready. They ain't ready. Tonight, as I said, I am honored to have served the people of Christ Church East Central. And as we embarked on this journey to come back to you with a fresh mandate, I am actually very, very, very excited about the future of Barbados. Very excited. But I temper that excitement with the real fact that things are only executable, ladies and gentlemen, when we have the resources to do it. And we've always said that our, the wealth of our country is really in our people. And Watton, you are part of those people. Christ Church is central, you are part of those people. And therefore, we must unite on a singular mission with a singular vision about how we are going to transform all the lives of Barbadians. And therefore, going forward, there are things that we may not be comfortable with totally. But we must look out for each other, see ourselves in each other. Because what we have been able to do the last 21 months is to ensure that all Barbadians, as best as we can, can keep their heads above water because the seas have been choppy. COVID-19 has been unrelenting. But as I said before, it will not define us. We simply will not let it define us. And there are those out there who will want to wait and see and wait and see and wait and see. But we will stay the course. We will continue to push the boundaries with respect to ensuring that all Barbadians can see a better life. That has been the mission of the Barbados Labour Party for the last 83 years. And that shall continue to be our mission. Because as a political party, you know, you know, you know the difference the Barbados Labour Party has made in all of your lives. You know this. I know this. And therefore, when you go to the polls on January 19th, Barbados, there is one choice, one choice. And as I come home here in Christchurch East Central, my name shall be number three on the ballot box. I want you to put the X next to Strong, number three on the ballot box. Do not let the X touch the line. Don't smudge it. Make sure it is crystal clear. Put your X next to Ryan Strong. Put your next ne ex next to the Barbados Labour Party candidate in your area and return the Barbados Labour Party and Mia Amor Mortley to be the next Prime Minister of Barbados. Thank you. God bless you and good night.
you heard it from your representative, Ryan Strong. Keep some noise. When you go to the polls, make sure you hear strong, strong, strong. I can't hear you. Strong. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to keep the energy in the place. You've been a great audience so far. But we're talking about leadership. We're talking about a woman who has your best interests at heart. A woman who works morning, noon, night on your behalf. A woman who the rest of the world continues to talk about. Please, put your hands together. Get up out of your seats. Welcome your Prime Minister, Mia Amor Monday. She got vibes alone. We voting me and Amon. She's the best PM for me. Me and the BLP. Who best to lead this country? Vote me and Team BLP. Have a disabled party. Is the only choice for we on the call. Good night, good night. I have to give thanks to the Almighty first. Because a few hours ago I had absolutely no voice. And over the course of the last few hours, it has come back almost like fine wine. But it has come back because I prayed for the opportunity to be able to speak to the people of a number of communities tonight. Tonight in Warren Ryan, I want you here because you know sometimes you got to talk straight to people. This man, this young man, is one of the reasons why Barbados could have withstood this pandemic in the last two years. You know him as Ryan Strong. You know him as a man, he's not a bling man. He ain't a boastful man. He ain't an arrogant man. He just is a solid man. And he is not going to tell you his story. He's not going to tell you how hard he and Marsha Cattle, along with the rest of the team, Clyde Maskell, Avinash Passad, um, Kevin Greenwich, the Director of Finance, the Permanent Secretary of Finance, and the whole Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs. How they have worked along with our advisors, White Oak, beyond the call of duty to take a country that was the third most indebted country in the world in May 2018. And in less than 19 months, put us on a path that allowed us to withstand the greatest crisis since independence. The man is so modest. Watch you here now. He's standing up next to me like this. <laughs> right, who stand up? So, I big you up and I want the people of this constituency to know that I have come here to say thank you on behalf of all Barbadians. The time for straight talk is now. You have to ask why it is that Frondell Stewart, perhaps the only good thing he ever did was to stop David Estwick from ever acting in the Ministry of Finance. 
You have to ask him why he never put him there. You have to ask him. Whenever I leave this country, Ryan Strong is the Minister of Finance. I can trust him. You can give him the keys to the treasury and know that you can find back every single cent. But more importantly, this man has presided and helped me bring into this country some of the most important pieces of legislation to keep this country safe and accountable. The Public Financial Management Act. And Ryan, right, don't feel no way about standing up next to me. Relax, because you're here next to me, because you're walking with me every step of the way on Wednesday, on Thursday. In fact, come this side, because you'll be my right hand, not my left hand. <laughs> For real, that Public Financial Management Act is what has us holding state-owned enterprises accountable. It is the first time since independence a Minister of Finance has signed a document setting out the state of affairs of this country fiscally. I did that last Monday. It was prepared by Ryan Strawn for me. And I can go on a new Central Bank Act, a new Customs Act, modernizing our payments so that we can move to digital payments, so that before the end of this year, you can use your phone and make your payments like anybody else in Kenya or other parts of the world where there are digital payments. I say to you, this is the man who the people who just graduated from a three-year degree at the University of the West Indies can thank because he is the man who has helped me find the $28 million when the Democratic Labour Party took free education at the university from you. And we have done it in the middle of both an IMF program and a pandemic. I can be straight sometimes I tell Ren Ren, the problem that Ryan got is that he ain't too much of a politician. <laughs> That's the truth. But sometimes in a family, you got some who like to fat and jump up. You got some who like to read books. Sometimes you got some who like to cook. Some who is homers. And some who can't stand in the house no matter what. Hey, That's all right. That's to tell the people who want to stand outside that they must come inside. That's for the mothers who tell the children to come back inside. My friends, your choice has never been clearer. Never. And this election will come to be regarded, in my opinion, as the most important election since independence. And why? We have too many battles to face in 12 to 15 years. But if we wait to the last minute to do it, you're going to lose, you're going to fail. The early worm does what? The early bird takes what? The worm. And we need now to make sure that the planning that has to go into place is put in place. You can't have more difficulties with a climate crisis. People can't get water and there are parts of Christchurch now that are not getting water that we hope within a few months we will reserve, resolve those problems with a new reservoir at Rising Sun and diverting water elsewhere. But there's a genuine groundwater crisis globally. Don't get tired. up. And then you have the freak storms and the storms whether here or down in parish land. Down by parish land, Wilfred is here, he will tell you that almost every storm that comes across Barbados, people in Parishland and Ferry Valley get the houses, and Silver Sands get the houses affected, just like the East Coast, because they're exposed to the winds. But it isn't only that. We have a population that has not been replaced since 1980. 
We have rather talk about any of these things in this campaign. She can't even tell us who is the leader of the Democratic Labour Party. Far less talk about these things. Oh, yeah. Every night, every night, them talking about president, president, president. But the only president is Dame Sandra Mason, the right, act, honorable, most honorable Dame Sandra Mason. No, we need to get serious now. And we have three days to get it right. Because when <laughs> Wednesday come and we don't get it right, you're going to end up with the glorious of Frandell, not the glorious in the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> You know best. Many of you work on the South Coast. Many of you knew what it was not to be able to go to work and get work because of the sewage flowing in the streets. Many of you know what it was even in this pandemic when we lost all of those people, Ryan, from working. And this government turned around and put $115 million in the national insurance scheme. We turned around and we put money in business interruption benefits that never existed before 2020. We created that. And that is why I say to you that leadership matters. We increased the welfare grants by over 20 million. We continue to do the electricals across all these housing estates. Because all of them, Watton, Gall Hill, Silver Hill, Haynesville, Deacon's Farm, Rosemont, Fernie Hurst, Kensington Lodge, all of them wanted rewiring. Some had electrical fires and damage, but you ain't hearing nobody tell you that Frandell Stewart and their government did anything about it. You don't even hear Verla talking about these issues relating to people in the housing estate. We have come to you with a credible program. Ryan and I spoke on Friday about the, 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 the almost irresponsible nature of what they're promising you. Let's get real. They can afford to promise anything because they ain't fighting for Bay Street, they're fighting for George Street. <laughs> That's a fact. So if you know you ain't fighting for George Street, for Bay Street, you can promise the world and its mother because you know you will never get tested. But we, who understand the solemn obligation that we have to you and the moral commitment we've given to you have come with serious, serious proposals. So when I say to you that in the next term, houses valued $400,000 or less will not pay land tax in this country, that is 40,000 households that will be taken off of the land tax roll. And another 40,000 people across this constituency and all the rest of Barbados whose houses are worth more than 400,000 will have a reduction on their bill because they will not pay on that first 400,000. It will cost us $21 million. And we know how we will execute it responsibly to benefit you. When we tell you that we are taking the VAT off of those four items, personal care items, they may appear to be modest, but you go and ask any single parent now who got girl children, three or four children, what they gotta buy if they're teenagers, they gotta buy the deodorant, they gotta buy the sanitary napkins, they gotta buy the vitamins and the multivinerals, they gotta buy the diapers if they got a young child or an elderly parent. We know what removing the VAT will cost us, and it's just under $3 million. When we tell you that we are going to bring a silent revolution in housing, we know what we're giving you, because the housing has been the biggest problem. How many years have you had a waiting list at the National Housing of 28,000 people? How many years? It's time for that to stop. How many years have we complained about government agencies not being responsive to residents when it comes to garbage or water or housing, etc.? We don't want a hand-picked constituency council. You heard Ralph Thorne on this platform tonight give an excellent speech talking about the relationship between politicians and constituents, talking about the importance of measures that we take for granted Everybody forgets that the pen is the mightiest of the swords. That when we go into parliament and we legislate a national minimum wage, 
people who have been treated as the dregs of this society all of a sudden have the opportunity to get a livable wage. And when they told me it couldn't happen, I said what? I said that with the pensions here in this constituency, a $70 increase every two weeks. And all of those pensioners in the last three and a half years have gotten each of them more than $7,000 since the Barbados Labour Party government has been elected that they would not have gotten had we not said, give me the vote and watch me. <laughs> Our whole home ownership program. Let me talk straight. A lot of people in Watton and Kingsland work in the public service. A lot of them are policemen and nurses and teachers and admin officers. A lot of you have children who can't go out there now and get a mortgage easy because the price of land is, was the last government left you land at 20 and $25 a square foot. And we came in, asked Ryan, and I get on bad and some of them come back at me and I get on bad again because I know what I wanted. And if that is what you say is despotic because they asking for it for you, well then so be it that we must cap the price of land at $12.50 a square foot for these home ownership programs. I'm serious. How else do you expect a police officer earning $2,700, $2,800, a nurse $2,800, $3,000 to buy land and build a house on $20 and $25 square foot land? How? And then on top of that, we say no, don't only rely on their salary. Give them the PV panels on top of the roof and let that earn for them to either offset totally the cost of the land or to help offset the cost of the mortgage. Pick your choice. And when you finish with that, we say no, not only new houses, not only the 10,000 new houses we can build in the next five years, but also 50,000 existing homes. And you got enough here in Watton and Kingsland must have access to a piece of the patrimony. It's not only about people coming in with foreign capital and getting to get the, the, the PV panels. Bajans must get a piece of the action too. And we commit to more than 50,000 existing houses working with the credit unions to be able to get a piece of the action to get that on the roofs. I say to you tonight, it is a philosophical position that differs from the Democratic Labour Party. Whoever wanted to come, to let them come. This government said, no, hold bricks. 30% of what you do in renewable energy as a foreign entity must be given to a Beijing entity to help participate. But secondly, we must create room in those measures for ordinary people, because we accept that ordinary people may not have the ready cash. And if we don't stand in line for them, they're going to get left out the line. Well, we are here, Ryan Strawn, Mia Motley, Marsha Cattle, and the economic team to stand in line for you. And what do you have instead? A Democratic Labour Party government that now wants to tell you who is going to be Minister of Finance if they were to win? Tell me who? David Eswick, that friend that won't even let out for one day. Kimar Stewart, that win. Poor fella, poor fella, he ran against me last time. He left Solutions and joined the BLP. He left the BLP and joined Joe Adley Party. He left Joe Adley Party and joined the Dems and went straight to the top of the class as General Secretary. I never see a man belong to four parties and gone straight to General Secretary of the Democratic Labour Party. You understand that's Errol Barr Party that we're talking about? And so low, so low, 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 did it go. That like you bring in a man who belonged to three parties before you in two years and make him General Secretary, and then boops, boops, poor fella, and I blame me. He got in a little trouble and the techie out. He wasn't good enough for them in George Street, but they want him to be good enough for the people of the city of Bridgetown. But he is the only one who said that he got an economics degree or getting trying to get one like Ryan. You understand 
that you talking about Ryan Strong versus Kima? No, 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 no. Ooh, what kind of madness we talking about now? Oh. You understand why I have come to Watton and Kingsland tonight? To ask you and to remind you that this country needs you to do for it what is absolutely necessary to keep Barbados stable? That is why I've come. And there may be some people who would have liked to see a little more here and a little more there. I would have liked to see a lot more. But we had COVID. 19 months we were without COVID. 24 months as a government we functioning with COVID. And we didn't just left you one side. 80,000 care packages. Ryan had to find the money for me to do that. If he didn't find it, you would not have gotten those care packages in the height of COVID. He had to help find the money for the NIS. He had to help find the money for the business interruption benefits and the grants for the small businesses. He had to help pay the university even when we're doing all this. What we inherited and what we now have is one of the success stories of the modern economy in this time. I'm not asking you. I didn't get to chair the development committee of the World Bank and the IMF. First time a Caribbean person and first time a Caribbean woman ever did it. I didn't get to do it. They don't pick the worst performing child in the class and tell them come and cheer. But you know that too. I didn't get for Barbados to be able to host UNCTAD, the smallest country in the world ever to host the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in a custom going to big developing countries like South Africa and Brazil and Kenya. But you know why we did it? Not because we want to have show, but if we want to get the policy space that we need to protect our farmers and to protect our manufacturers, we need to be able to go in and argue for ourselves as a small island developing state. And it may seem a little complex, just like how I go to the doctor. The doctor has been telling me one thing, but what's wrong with me? I just remember about three or five of the things they tell me. I don't remember the rest. And then I just got to beg somebody to tell me again. Don't get tired. All of us brain and hardware the same way. But when it comes to managing this economy, you need somebody who knows what they're doing. And if that person has performed as well as Ryan Strawn, then I say to you, give me Ryan Strawn on Wednesday morning to continue the journey. <laughs> and straight talk. I tell Ryan, as I said, we're going to put the systems because a lot of what you are asking for is not really about the MP alone. It is because our system is broken. And that is why we ask Ralph Thorne to chair the Commission on Governance. And that is why he's about to come to you with their report. And even that report took longer in coming because of the COVID. But we believe that we have it across this entire country to elect persons to help hold accountable the NHC, the Water Authority, all of the state-owned enterprises down to even the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, that there's room for you to come in and help us with the garbage cans being collected, garbage being collected, with the street lights, with other things, so that there's a partnership in building strong communities. But even without that, Ryan has delivered for you the wells down here in these housing estates. Remember we lost a little boy in the pine, in a well, and the government took a decision even though we didn't have money. We had to find the money to correct the wells because we could not afford to lose another child in this country. These are the decisions that we make because leadership matters. And when others tell you that they can't do I am prepared to, we on a feel now, I am prepared to step out the crease and play the shots. If you play inside the crease all the time, you're gonna get lick up. You can't make the runs, you can't carry forward the game. But when I step out the crease, 
and not stepping out and slashing wildly. Why you know how the late cut and I know the front drive and cover drive? Why are you? You have to read it. And uh, 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 look, let us be clear. Our IMF program comes to an end this year. People ask me, what are you going to do about it? And we said, you have to wait and see what the outturn figures are. You have to wait and see what the cost of capital, the interest rates are. I am make decisions based on where we are. The bottom line is the IMF did not impose anything on us that we didn't want to do. We developed our own Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program. There are elements of it that have to be tweaked because of the pandemic. But we are going after growth aggressively this year. And Ryan will tell you that this year and next year, we expect double digit growth and we expect to turn the corner. We know that Omicron is still with us, but the modeling that the university has given us, thank God, has not come yet. And we hope it won't. And we give thanks to the leadership of the Ministry of Health, Jeffrey Bostick and the CMO and all of the medical professionals for working beyond the call of duty. But I want to give thanks to you, the ordinary people, because you, more than most populations in the Caribbean, have listened, have cooperated, and have made Barbados better off by being able to correct a ring around us so that we can keep both the absolute case numbers down, but more importantly, the number of deaths down. You see why I give thanks to the Lord for giving me back a voice tonight? This is a serious election. And if I had to symbolize it in one place, in one person, Ryan Strong against, I can't remember the fellow name. What you name? I can't remember. I can't remember. Ryan Strong is who has kept businesses in this country open. Ryan Strong is who has kept money in your pocket. Ryan Strong is who has given you back money as unemployment benefit and business interruption benefits. Ryan Strong is who has allowed your children to go back to university and finish three-year degrees without you having to look for the money and leave him one side or leave her one side and next thing you know they're pregnant and they can't get back in easily. Ryan Strong has been responsible for helping to keep this economy up. But more importantly, we came to office, the last government in its glorious Frandel years was owing $1.9 billion to Beijing companies and Beijing individuals. And through the careful stewardship and management of the economic and financial team, led not only by me, but by Ryan and Marsha, we have been able to bring that down to $65 million. Do you know how many countries across the world would want an economic record that the Barbados Labour Party government has given this country in the last three years? And you know what's the sad part? Almost all of it came in the first two years. But because of COVID, we had to draw breaks to save lives. We had to hire people in the ASH program. We have said to you, you are staying there, and Ryan is going to help me keep you staying there until there's sufficient construction activity and other activity in the country that you can move seamlessly into one job from one job to the next. This is a government that leads with a heart. And when I hear the others talk, can't give you who is the political leader, can't get a manifesto out. If you can't get a manifesto out safely, how are you going to keep a country safe? If you can't even tell the truth, they got a meme going around with Richard Seeley claiming that we have, we have failed by every economic metric. And when you see the fellas brecky up, licky up, mashy up, dunny up, make LRG song seem good, blue. True. These guys have no shame. And I tell them 
don't test me. Because if you feel you got a red file, you got a red bag, and the election ain't done yet. The election ain't done yet. Trust me. I am saying to you, my friends, the choice has never been clearer. And to you, the residents of Wharton, the National Housing Corporation has started with the electrical upgrades. They must do better with the maintenance issues. I have said it, I have seen it, and we will work to make it better, not just to build new houses, but we will make your lives easier on the things that humbugging you when the day come, especially if we can get these councils in place that will allow you to be able to hold them accountable geog geographically. Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning. Bright and early. Come out and give Ryan Strong Adrian Medic Ford, Wilfred Abrams, Ralph Thorne, and of course, William Dugan. Your vote. Allow us to continue the journey. Allow us to transform the nation. I don't know how many of you have gone in town to Golden Square, but you need to. You need to. Because if you go there, you begin to see the best of who we are. But you also see how a party can keep a vision alive for 22 years and deliver it. Right here in Newton, in this constituency, will be the Barbados Heritage District. Long before any of us were thought of, Slaves were being buried at Newton Plantation. Over the last 40 years, they have found the remains of 570 slaves. This government has said, we feel embarrassed to belong to the parliament that gave this world the 1661 slave code that became the document that represented how black people were to be treated throughout the Americas. It came from the Barbados Parliament. It spawned other slave codes in the Americas. We believe that as the children of independence, we have a solemn duty to repay the world for that awful act in the 17th century. And we shall repay them by making sure that we can tell our story in our own way. We have gotten one of the world's most famous architects, the man who designed the building in, of the African American Museum in Washington, DC. And he has already designed a project that will create jobs and that will allow for a museum and a genealogical research center because our archives have the second largest transatlantic slave records in the entire world after the United Kingdom. What does that mean? That people will come here and want to see it. What does it mean that there will be jobs in this constituency for that Barbados Heritage District right there on the Newton Slave Burial Ground? that is already designated by UNESCO, a museum, a genealogical research center. So you go, all of us, go and see who we family is and who really family to family because sometimes family to families end up in certain places <laughs> that they shouldn't end up. You really need to check. <laughs> and then the monument. But it is fundamentally about jobs. And if we continue to do the right things, continue to have the investment, not just in the hotels, we expect to build a free zone, to have a free zone built here so that companies can come here and do things and have the logistics of exporting them into the Americas or elsewhere again. Some may be goods, some may be services. We expect to have a life sciences industry that will allow us to take your children that went and studied science, five, six thousand of them, 
Study in the last five years at UWI, and most of them got to settle to teach because we don't have opportunities for jobs for them in this community. And you then start to cry when they tell you that them won't go away and work in the States or England or Canada because they can't get a job out here. This is our country. And if we don't take control, and if we don't own our future, that is what our manifesto cover says. Our Barbados owning our future. And I've come to public life not to make tenants of our people in their own country. I've come to make you owners. That is why the silent revolution in housing matters. That is why the financial literacy matters. That is why the renewable energy matters. That is why we are going to give you chances to own in Sam Lord's Castle and other properties that the government owns. That is why we will establish, and this is a long, long, long project, but if you don't do like the Chinese and the Indians, and see things in terms of a century and two centuries, you can always be playing catch up. And I learned too much for me to come out here as a child of independence and only govern for the next 10 years. We will create a Barbados Wealth Fund where we put assets, all the lands, a lot of the lands that government own, some of the companies, so that the money earned in that Barbados Wealth Fund can come to you once it starts to get positive returns in a dividend check for everybody over 18. I don't expect it to happen in my lifetime. But if we don't start it in my lifetime, then my nieces and them can't benefit in 30 years and your children can't benefit in 30 years time. And if we must learn one thing from Frondas in glorious period, it is that we need to export capital, as Ryan would tell you. You can't only put all your money in Barbados. If a hurricane come and lick up everything, everything lick up. We need to start exporting money and investing in Guyana, investing in Trinidad, investing in Costa Rica, investing all over the world. That is why you see me going out and having these different conversations. We need to reclaim our destiny in Africa. How the hell? After three, four centuries, you don't have a direct plane link to Africa or a direct um, ship coming from Africa. Who owns our destiny if not ourselves? And what do you have as a choice? Verla and them who in a cuss fest this weekend. People won't tell you about who got who, who ain't got who, what, 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 because they can't tell you what I sit down here and talk to you about tonight. They can't give you a record either between 2008 and 2018 or between 1986 and 94. It is sad. But the fact that it is sad does not mean that they should carry you down in the hole with them. Let them sort out themselves in George Street and you focus on electing a government in Bay Street. And the road to get there it's not to say that you're vexed about this or you're vexed about that. Everybody in a family is get vexed sometimes. Somebody cook and you eat out all the food before they get back. They're going to get vexed. Somebody use a bad word that they shouldn't use in front of the grandmother and they're going to get vexed. Somebody wanted a chance to get a tongue but they didn't have the bus fare and you went long without giving them the bus fare and didn't give them the ride and they get vexed. Vex is a part of life, but we get happy too. But when we get vexed and happy, we never forget the fundamental things of life. We don't forget to breathe. We don't forget to keep the household together. Because if we forget those things, the consequences of the vex is death or loss of liberty. So that I say to you tonight, this country is at an inflection point, is at a particular point in its history that what you do will matter. And for those who say they're not coming out to vote, that is a vote for the Democratic Labour Party. It is. And it is a vote for the alliance that they are financing. Just to be a spoiler. I tell you, Joe, other of you used to sit down opposite me all the time. And when you really study ahead about all these people that vex with the vex boat, that invariably they didn't get a cabinet pick, they get a cabinet pick tech way, or they couldn't get to run in a seat. I get it. I get it. But at the end of the day, the one thing I did when I went into government house, as it was then on May 25th, 2018, was to swear to put this country first 
and that duty must come above all else, including friendship and family. And I hold myself to that standard. And I say to you tonight, that if we want to continue on this journey, and if we want to give this country its best possible chance, I'm not only talking to you tonight as listeners, I'm talking to you tonight as activists now. Activists in the interest of a Barbados that must prosper. Activists in the interest of a Barbados that must become safe. Activists in the interest of a Barbados that can do for you and your family in a way that other governments didn't see you, didn't hear you, they didn't see the agricultural workers that your grandmothers and grandfathers were. They didn't care that they had to go in the fields and do everything in the open. This government saw it and changed it. They didn't care about the absence of working for decent wage. This government saw it and changed it. They didn't care about the non-contributory pensioners who would tell me not to give the $70 increase to. We saw it and changed it. They didn't care about the fact that public servants many of whom live out here, ain't get a salary increase in five, in 10 years, and we gave you a 5%, even while going in to an IMF program. They didn't care that the roads weren't getting done and your shots getting lick up every day when you're driving wrong. They didn't care about the fact that you had to wait up at night worrying if your child was gonna come home safe because the buses weren't running in time and they're coming in at nine o'clock at night. They didn't care about the fact that your businesses on the South Coast could not supply services to you because of sewage running in the street. They didn't care. They didn't care about the need to give ordinary people a chance with a trust loan because no bank in town ain't looking at you and giving you nothing because they want your mother paper, your grandmother paper, your grandfather paper too. And the credit unions, a little better, but them anchoring it to shares. So you got $300, you're getting 900, three times three. And we say no. If this government of Barbados that's spending over $3 billion can't put one, say $10 million a year to get ordinary people in this country a chance to go and borrow 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000, and if you pay it back, you can go up to 10,000 to help you create a credit history so you could then transition to the same bank or to the credit union or to fund access. These are the things that matter. The hour is late, the curfew is on. I hope that that will not be a thing for much longer either. But we gotta get around this little corner here with Omicron. And that is why I say that we will make the decisions on schools on the 24th of January. We can make it together. We can make it together. I know it in my heart. And for those who say that my saying that this is my last term is a gimmick, I say I have been consistent in my life about not believing that a person should spend more than 10 years. I don't believe you should spend more than 10 years. I used to talk about term limits, but it is really time limits because Omicron and COVID and everything has shown us that sometimes you gotta give yourself options but time limits, why? Barbados has known what it is to have two prime ministers serve 15 years. You can't educate people and expect to be in the same position. If I really didn't want to do it, you think I'd be talking about it every night to you, so? Give me a chance. I'm doing it because the country must get accustomed to the idea that we must bring up our people and uplift them and give them opportunities and let them be the best that they can be. And I have seen myself as a bridge, nothing more than a bridge. This is 32 years. In another five years, it will be 37. And if I can't be that bridge for you to the new journey, to the new mission, then something is wrong. And I would have literally betrayed all of the persons who helped me get here and train me and nurture me. I say to you tonight, my friends, from my heart, my heart, this country is too great. This country has been too good to us, and we now need to do right by it. We've started, but the journey is not over. I have told you I probably will not finish the journey with you, largely because it is going to take more than an electoral term. We will not get everything done in the next five years, but we must get most of it done in the next 10 if we are to avoid the calamitous consequences that face us in 12 to 15 years from climate 
to pandemic. And I don't mean the COVID one, I mean the other one. To population deficit, to security problems with social security issues. And as I am at it, it is a damn dastardly lie to tell any pensioner in this country that the Labour Party cutting the pensions. We are the ones that increase your pensions. We've not cut anybody's pension rate. So my friends, you must be activists tonight. Go tomorrow and Tuesday. Talk to who living by you. Talk to who work with you. Talk to who lime in with you. And recognize that this election is not one for apathy and don't care to step in. But if you haven't checked it yet, this is going to be one of the most important elections in this country's history. And what you do will determine the kind of life you have in the next decade to 12 to 15 years. Straight talk. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to like what I say. But remember, it was said. And to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And to come out and to ignore it is to be a willing victim of anything that can happen. I don't play life that way. I don't believe in serendipity. I plan out each and every day. And I ask you now to plan out your future, own your future. Vote for Ryan Strawn in Christchurch East Central. Vote for Adrian Medic Ford in Christchurch West Central. Vote for Wilfred Abrams in Christchurch East. Vote for William Dugit, who is there in Christchurch West. And vote for Ralph Thorne in Christchurch South. And if you catch me a little more, go cross in Southeast, St. Michael Southeast, and vote for Santia in Fort George down there. Good night and God bless you. One more time. You've been a fantastic audience. Those persons in Water Kingston and the surrounding areas, thank you for having us with you this evening. You have heard from a cadre of speakers from the Barbados Labour Party. The choice is yours, the future is yours. Go out in your numbers on Monday and do what you need to do to keep your country safe. Good night. God bless you all. We're out of here.